Hello, Derek. Just a question. Derek, uh, you are mute. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I can. Yeah, do you know the sharing the screen. You can. You, should you do it at the beginning or you can do it at any time? At, at any you time. You can do it at any time. Yeah, because you know I have the controls with you. After you have yeah, the after, control. Yes. Whenever you are ready, all you have to do is press that green arrow, yes. and uh, your screen will be shared. Yeah, yeah. After you know, after five minutes or so, then I'll share. Whenever, the whenever. Yes, I've I've uh, given uh, you uh, the control as a co-host, so you can yes. start sharing any time that you okay. want. Okay. Well, uh, Giri, good after I introduce, Dr. Mary, good to see you. Good afternoon, everyone. You. Yes, yes. Yeah, that will uh, be nice. Hello, yes. Uh, hello, Mary, and uh, very good to see Gita. Good day, Gita. Good afternoon, ma'am. She's also uh, she's also an important fellow with, and our Brigadier Raju. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, sir. Good afternoon. Very good afternoon. Uh, Shrikant, I've put the uh, YouTube live link. So that can be shared on uh, WhatsApp as well, in case others need to join in directly. Derek, would you mind posting the YouTube link on the chat room in the chat done, room? Done already. It's there on the chat box. I'm just sending it to your YouTube as well, uh, okay. to your WhatsApp. And uh, anytime you're ready, you tell me. I'll start the recording. I think it might be a good idea to get started. So thank you. Okay, the recording and live both are there. So Shrikant, you can take it ahead. So welcome my friends, joining the second IAO PM virtual conference. And I'm speaking to you from the academic center of based at Chesford Park Hospital, Doncaster. We have with us um, the eminent speakers from various fields and also a number of delegates joining us from different countries and also from different time zones. As you know, this is the second of the two IAOPM conferences that we have organized. We had the last meeting last Saturday, which went extremely well. And speakers have delivered fantastic talks and there was good engagement and participation. And I received extremely ve very good feedback in terms of uh, the insights shared by the speakers. We have also recorded the whole event. So in due course, I'll be forwarding the presentations and also the uh, whole recording of the event. I would like to say that, I mean, the second virtual conference is an extension of the first and there's an overlap of some of the themes and some of the speakers will carry on some of the debates and discussions that we discussed in the first meeting. As I mentioned to you in my correspondence, in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic, it is very important that we understand some of the workplace related psychopathologies and understand how we can address some of the challenges posed as a result of this. And some of the speakers are going to offer their insights and also some solutions for the problems. But firstly, let me Take, take this opportunity to explain to you what IAOPM essentially is. The International Institute of Organizational Psychological Medicine has humble beginnings 
in Australia more than seven years ago, and it is the brainchild of Professor Russell De Souza, who is with us, who is also the dean of the institute. And over the years, I think the institute has expanded globally, both to USA, UK, and also many parts of the world. And we have various eminent psychiatrists, management professionals who received fellowships and memberships from the Institute and have contributed to the field. So essentially, IAOPM's main objective is to promote positive mental health awareness and research and address some of the challenges posed in relation to the work-related psychopathologies in the workforce. Various studies have concluded that issues like burnout, stress, compassionate fatigue, embitterment, and we have heard about this in the last meeting, have significantly reduced the productivity in organizations. So it also comes down to the human capital. And one of the aims of the Institute is enhancing the human capital potential and increasing work-related productivity. To that effect, we have organized a number of conferences, seminars, symposiums in relation to promoting this in various organizations. So firstly, if you were to look, at, look back and ask, what is human capital? Human capital is one of the important resources with, within any organization, and it is a sum total of individual intelligence, knowledge, skills, wisdom, emotional intelligence, and experience of the individuals in an organization and also collectively as of all these individuals in an organization. And time, time and again, it has proven that enhancing the human capital potential has increased the productivity in various organizations. So one of the objectives of IAOPM is to identify, prevent, and also manage some of the work-related psychopathologies as I mentioned earlier, including stress, burnout, demoralization, embitterment, et cetera, and increase the emotional well-being of individuals and also the productivity of organizations. To that effect, as I mentioned earlier, we have worked with many organizations and also build up collaborations with a number of institutes, academic institutes, and also hospitals across the world. And we have memorandum of understanding with number of institutions across the world and we have people joining us collaborating engaging and taking some of the initiatives we have um, identified and institute also is working towards bringing together the evidence base in various areas related to organization psychological medicine in the form of a textbook. And Oxford University Press has commissioned a first textbook in this field. And we have contributions from more than 70 authors from nearly 20 countries contributing to this book. So we, we are hopeful that, I mean, we'll be able to produce this book in the next one year. And that will certainly give more insights to individuals in terms of tackling some of the challenges in the workforce. Importantly, I would like to say that COVID-19 has posed a number of challenges to not only individuals, but also organizations. But at an individual level, it has created some chaos, uh, moral injury, uh, uncertainty, and some of the speakers today will certainly address some of these things in more detail. Finally, I would like to say that the Institute is working towards promoting various initiatives and also trying to identify some tailored solutions to address some of the problems. At the moment, we have many solutions to address some of the problems like um, mindfulness, uh, power nap, one of our colleagues will join us to talk about that. The use of a TMS in terms of enhancing emotional well-being and Professor DeSouza's own um, initiative or solution, wisdom competency therapy. But what we are trying to do is to test them at a 
at, at different in different settings in different organizations so that we can offer tailored interventions in the future finally i would like to say that i would request you all to engage with the institute and i'm based at chesterfield park hospital which is academic center i want you to collaborate projects to take and expand this field further and also to further our knowledge and understanding of some of these issues i would like you to contribute to give feedback share new ideas and also help us to publish some original articles in the iopm bulletin which we publish every year and i request you all to join me in this initiative to promote more understanding about this field before we go on to the next uh, before we go on to the talks i would like to request professor de souza to say a few words in the light of the current covid 19 pandemic and share his insights and chair the first session of this meeting thank you very much over to you professor de souza thank you professor shrikant nimagada uh, a very good morning to all of you in in the united kingdom uh, and good afternoon good evening and of course in melbourne australia it is night so good night to some of our colleagues in australia uh many um a uh, big welcome to all us fellows we have many fellows uh here who of the institute um several vice chancellors of uh, our brigadier raju from the industrial psychiatry president and so forth very welcome to all of you who are, who have joined us uh, today for the part 2 or, or the second part of the uh, outstanding uh, uh iopm conference that brought together a very um, um interesting but very important uh, aspect in managing the human capital and particularly where we bring the heart and mind in alignment with the strategic directions of an organization any organization and we've learned now from many and in fact management has now understood the importance of the heart and mind management managing the mind and that's where the human capital management differs from human resource management all of you know and all of you have human hr but hr uh, does not have in its in its mandate the mind the managing of the very important heart and mind and of course after the after the uh, corporate uh, corporal uh, sorry the um, uh, corporate failures of the 2000 and still after the gfc and so forth some of the areas that came out were well, uh, to be improved in management has been the importance of heart and mind management or alignment with the strategic direction and this is something that uh, we uh, in 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 the process and that's what uh, we are uh, specializing in and this is probably one of the uh, the newest disciplines or branches of psychological medicine and the interesting aspect is that um i institute brings in uh, leadership management we have psychologists managers vice chancellors anyone who's managing uh, uh, human capital human beings has a role and will have a place uh, to to uh, understand learn and contribute to the uh, to the international institute of organizational psychological medicine and today we are going to see uh, here some of our uh, speakers from uh, our, uh, international speakers today we have from around the world who will be speaking to us from united kingdom from um, uh, Parallel from France, um, <coughs> Amsterdam, um, uh, uh, and India, and and several other places. So we'll be we'll be hearing some uh, excellent uh, talks, and I'm delighted uh, to chair 
the first session of this uh, program today, I want to acknowledge uh, some of our uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. E. Mondas, who is the uh, a board member from for India, the director. Several others uh, are here for um, um, part of the uh, Dr. Uh, Clyde Rodriguez, who is the registrar of the IAOPM, um, uh, who uh, works with the dean. And of course, uh, we had Professor Rajiv Tandon, uh, who was who addressed you, who is the chair of the board, who is currently the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at the Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo. He probably will be joining us. He chaired and opened this uh, last uh, at the last meeting. So, uh, with, with all this now, I, I and we will be continuing to talk and inter in, and interact with, with all of you here. And we, I want to wish you uh, a, a, a very, uh, I can guarantee you that you're going to have a very interesting, stimulating and thought provoking um, uh, next few hours in this second part of, uh, of the, uh, the International Institute of Organizational Psychological Medicine's um, conference, Dr. Sh Dr. Shrikant Nimagada is the head and director of the academic center of uh, IOEOPM, which was um, established about at our last meeting, which was two years ago. And we had the, for those of you who didn't, who are not here uh, last week, we had the, uh, the, uh, the uh, CEO of Chesterfield Park who gave a beautiful presentation on leadership in the COVID, what, uh, how the leadership, the leadership they use. And so we'll see here about leadership management and one of many of these areas. And certainly as Dr. Nimagoda, as uh, Professor Nimagoda has said, the COVID has brought, if anything, besides the, uh, the, the, uh, the treatment and care, one of the important areas has been the workforce, the workplace, and both in the workforce and outside, because people lost their jobs, people at work had problems coping with the changes, and the healthcare workforce has significantly been impacted. And one of, as we said, we are doing some work on the important area of moral injury. We had a doctor, there is Dr. Baliga, who looks after the research, and we're doing some work on looking at moral distress and moral injury that the workforce, the healthcare workforce, dealing and looking after uh, the COVID patients have, um, have, it's been related, it's been reported all over the world. So we're doing some more work on this important area. It, once upon a time, it was something, it was meant to only be seen in the battlefield. And for the first time, we are now seeing a surge in moral distress, moral injury, which is also associated with toxic stress and toxic, uh, sorry, to um, uh, um, um, tolerable stress and toxic stress. And, thereby, and with that, the significant pathologies that come with it. So having said all this, I welcome all of you. Thank you all for joining us and continue to be part of this uh, uh, international organization. I have to say we have in our participants here, uh, participants from around the world, from South America, Middle East, um, uh, and certainly from Asia, uh, Europe, and America. So welcome to all of you from around the world. So uh, our program today, we have uh, three excellent speakers, and I'm going to introduce our first speaker to you. And this is Dr. Sheshaguri Rao Nimagada. Dr. Sheshaguri Rao is currently a consultant forensic psychiatrist since 2004. He's the current medical director uh, since 2011 at the Thornford, Thornford Park Hospital in Thatcham in the United Kingdom. Now, Dr. Kiri has 
we fondly call him, has a very long distinguished career uh, in, uh, with many organizations, but has had significant uh, positions in the Royal College of Psychiatrists of United Kingdom. He has been a member of the Council of the Royal College. He has been on management uh, committees, uh, building committees, and, and also on, uh, on the Foreign Seat Secretary Executive. Um, and a, a lot of, uh, prob uh, uh, probably a large number of areas that he served in managing in the, in the executive, in the highest circles of the famous Royal College of Psychiatrists of the United Kingdom. Uh, and he's also been on the Foreign Seek Psychiatry Social and Rehabilitation Psychiatry Interface Group and on the uh, Specialist Advisory Committee. He's also uh, uh, on the Mental Health Law Committee. Uh, the training, the college trainees committee, and so forth. So he's contributed to this, to the um, uh, to psychological medicine in a in a, in a very meaningful uh, and important way. He's also had a very important role in several positions with the very important British Indian Psychiatrist Association. It is one of the large associations after the Royal College in the United Kingdom. And uh, Dr. Giri has been a, a, an executive committee member, general secretary, but finally was also the president of this very august uh, um, organization and currently is a trustee. Today, Dr. Namagada will offer an experience based perspective on various issues that need to be considered after returning to work post-COVID-19 infection. And he's probably going to relate to us his experience of actually having been uh, um, um, uh, uh, exposed and contracting uh, the COVID-19 in the context of his work. As you all know, the United Kingdom is having uh, uh, the workforce is having a la, uh, an undue um, uh, exposure and, and, and uh, certainly a uh, uh, um, number of positive cases have come. And in fact, many, uh, or we have lost the workforce, the health workforce in the United Kingdom have lost many of their uh, um, doctors and nurses and so forth. And I'm very happy that uh, we are very delighted that uh, Dr. Shechi Rao not only had this, but came out of it successfully to be with us, and now going to actually talk about this um, experience and for the benefit of all the others. So, Dr. Shesagiri Rao uh, uh, Nimagada, I welcome you uh, to offer your presentation. And over to you. Good, good morning, everybody. Good morning from London. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Professor De Souza, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, you'll be always generous, as always. Uh, and uh, first of all, uh, let me congratulate uh, uh, Professor De Souza and Professor Srikant for putting up this excellent program. I was there in the last week's uh, first uh, world conference of this uh, IOPM. Fantastic talks very insightful, uh, and they managed to gather wonderful speakers from across the world. And also, if you look at the participants today, and there are people from all over the world, apart from United Kingdom, India, Australia, Canada, United States, there are people from Iraq, Amsterdam, Brazil. It, it's a very, very worldwide phenomena, and it's very apt in the sense that COVID is sweeping across the world. So today uh, I'm going to talk about my personal journey in various roles uh, in this epidemic. I'm, I've been in front line in so many ways. Um, there are some intense emotions. There are some intense experiences. 
um, again, with the heart of a, a doctor, with the heart of a psychiatrist, with the heart of a, a member of a family, with the heart of a medical director, it's very varied. Probably it's unlike anything I have experienced and unlike anybody has experienced like in, in their own lives in the sense that there isn't a single person on the face of this earth now who are not affected by COVID. Unless, you know, you are one of those, you know, a jungle tribe in, in, in Brazilian Amazon where who are completely untouched by the civilization. There, there isn't any human being outside, you know, in, in this interconnected world who is not touched by COVID. So with that uh, brief introduction, let me uh, go to my talk. Uh, I'm sharing my slides here. Yes. Uh, let me start the PowerPoint. Slideshow. Yes. So my the title of my talk is Returning to Work Post-COVID Infection and Experience-Based Perspective. Uh, so, so uh, COVID is a pandemic of unknowns. There is, there are so many unknowns in this world. It it has shattered our myth that you know we have this uh, uh, feeling that as human beings we have advanced so much in science and everything, and we know a lot. And this pandemic has made us to believe how little we know, how unprepared we are. And this is without precedent. There is, there is nothing like this we have seen, anybody has seen in our lifetimes. Because the last one was 100 years ago and the people who have faced it, who have been through that, uh, they're no longer here. So the, the memory is very short. We don't learn, we, 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 we don't look at our history, we don't look at our uh, past. Uh, and it, it's very surprising that you know we anticipate so many things, and why couldn't we anticipate something like this coming? If you if you look at all the two hundred odd countries in this world, if there is a single skirmish, single uh, conflict, every country is prepared to go to war in the next minute. They are so much prepared, but when there is a healthcare crisis of this proportion, why even the most advanced countries are not able to react? So this is something for us to reflect, for us to think, for us to, uh, for, for, for us to you know, take it forward. So, and uh, when, when it comes to the healthcare, there is no experience in dealing with this. There is no training in dealing with this and there is no strategy. And I would call the whole situation as total unpreparedness. So as I said, it's just not a COVID is not a medical problem. It is a public health problem because this is not something, a disease you treat in the hospitals. This is, a, this is something which is concerned with a common man on the, on the corner of your street. Everybody is involved in this. It's a social problem. It's through so many social challenges which we never even imagined that would exist. Organizational. We, we, the, the world has got organized into these huge organizations where we're all part of it. And we, 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 the, the organizations got affected in the sense that, you know, the major health delivery organization in the United Kingdom is NHS. Uh, along with fighting against COVID, one of the biggest concern for the government and everybody is to make sure that NHS is not collapsing with this. So you have to protect the organization to help it. And then the psychological aspects. Uh, the, the, especially with the lockdowns and with, uh, with, with these kind of restrictions uh, and so many psychological aspects have come to the fore. Economic, a lot of people lost their jobs, lost their livelihoods, and that will have so many other uh, interlinked problems. Political, we have seen people are losing their jobs, uh, people are changing regimes, COVID has a huge impact uh, across the across the spectrum, and and family family wise, you know, I I observed this interesting phenomena 
where during the first lockdown in the United Kingdom, the families are locked in the house because previously people used to have this space. The husband used to go and work and the wife had her own job or some other uh, issue. So when you lock everybody into a family, when the, 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 the dysfunction, you know, some of the aspects which are not evident were coming out and that is le leading to so many other problems. So probably COVID without, you know, any design has instituted, kind of has had, had started a huge social experiment on the face of this earth. There's so many things that, that, that are going to learn. And interpersonal, interpersonal also, it affected a lot of these interpersonal uh, relationships. And, and so it is, it is a multidimensional problem. So coming to myself, I would broadly divide into three aspects because I got three major roles. What, uh, I mean, three major experiences in this crisis. One is as a manager, as a medical director of a large psychiatric hospital, uh, which is which have got 130 beds, uh, which employs 450 staff. So it's it's a sizable organization. Uh, then, as a psychiatrist, as a doctor, I have my patients. I have to protect them, and and what are the challenges I face there? And then, as a patient, so I am a sufferer. I I was one of the first people who. Uh, contracted COVID in a very severe form, and what are my own experiences? So, so those are the three levels I'm going to share. Starting from my own experience, it is uh, people in United Kingdom can relate uh, to it straight away, but I'll I'll be a bit give you a bit more detail so that you know people from other parts of the world can uh, can can have some kind of uh, awareness. Uh, it is mid March. 2020 and just in february we are all aware that you know northern italy in the alps uh, covid is very much uh, prevalent it is rampant so a lot of these holiday makers from uh, england they were transported back to the uk and we all know that in early march it's all going very fast we didn't know the magnitude of it and uh, the numbers were creeping, you know, we have single digits, then you have 50s, 100s. And at that time, when I contracted COVID on the 13th, 14th of March, it was 700 uh, the, the, all, all over the UK. So, and this is before a couple of days before the lockdown, they were talking about the lockdown, but we, we didn't have it. The children, the kids were going to school. So uh, we don't know where we contracted from. Uh, my wife uh, from two days earlier was having some kind of body pains and uh, headaches. We thought it's, it's nothing related to COVID. Uh, then when at work, I'm getting these requests that you know my, some, somebody in my, my house is coughing, uh, my child is coughing, should I come to work or should I not come to work? So these, we are facing these kind of ethical dilemmas. Uh, so, we always kind of in these pandemics, we have to be safe. So whenever there is somebody who is having any kind of symptoms in their in their household, we are asking them not to come. Uh, I remember a colleague, you know, the, just before I went sick, a, a colleague who was in the car park and he, he rang me when I'm in the hospital saying that he just received a fair telephone call uh, that his wife rang him that his son have temperature. So he said, what should I do? I think, you know, I said, you should go home. You cannot come into the hospital. So we are getting all these kind of things. It's uh, the, the crescendo, it was building up. Then I, uh, uh, the, my, my wife uh, suffered from, you know, she started having temperature and cough and, and I got it. And then I went sick. So then we are expecting, because we knew that most of the people who are fit and healthy they are having minor symptoms and that will go away. But uh, unfortunately, we are not one of those lucky ones. Our symptoms are severe. Uh, the cough was relentless. Uh, we got high temperatures and uh, it was, uh, I mean, luckily the oxygen, my oxygen sats are fine, but my voice were dropping and the weakness was terrible. The body pains are, you know, they're very, very severe. So. 
when when that was the situation the point i want to make is see, you became a service user uh, all of a sudden from being a medical manager managing your patients managing your staff you became a service user you became a patient then you want help uh, in any ordinary circumstances even if we had half of those symptoms we would have gone to a hospital but now or we would have called the gp to start with the gp surgeries they said if you have covid symptoms please ring 111 that is the semi emergency service before 99 is is emergency but you have anything less than that you have to ring 111 in the uk so the gp surgeries are are shut in a way for covid patients then you ring 111 and it it is uh, it is an experience in the sense that you it takes an hour to get through and once you get through there uh you get an, a very inexperienced person who will be saying that you know i can't do much you go to the nhs website and we know what is there on the nhs website you know general some basic principles saying that you know you wash your hands you you take some precautions there is nothing no medical help then you have the ane that is the emergency department accident and emergency they have a big board saying that if you have covid don't come stay at home but the thing is this is a medical problem see having a virus having contracted a virus is one thing but developing medical complications as a result of virus becomes a medical problem so at that time the whole system became inoperational and it shut down i'm sure a lot of studies will come soon there is a huge rise in mortality in the united kingdom because united kingdom was one of the countries which which stood out for its mortality uh, across the globe not even not even in the you know developed countries but across the globe i think probably this is the one of the reasons where the medical help is not there um covid will last for 14 days and it will go but if you treat the medical complications with simple things like you know oxygen antibiotics some kind of supportive care uh, you can save lives but that was not happening and uh, then you your your psychological uh, thinking like you're you're isolated then isolated and the whole country was shut down people can't come to you because you know you are at risk and you you can't seek help and you you don't have provisions the friends were helping at that time it is an experience to see for the first time what it means to be a patient as a service user particularly for me in, in the 23 years i've been working in the united kingdom i haven't been sick for a single day i'm a healthy person thank god but but this sickness has come at a time when everything has shut down so what kind of feeling do you have you are a part of the healthcare system you are delivering but when it comes to you there is no help the system is not responsive so i think uh, these are kind of some kind of the embitterment feelings what uh, the professor disserza talks about uh, the, the embitterment is severe w- what should you do and uh, luckily being a doctor you have some advice from your friends and you have you know things like pulse oximeter uh, and you know when to react when to call the ambulance um, we 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 called the ambulance in fact on two occasions i won't go into the details but luckily nothing has happened Uh, but but what about a common man who does not have that medical knowledge what about a common man who who don't have pulse oximeter uh, so these are the kind of things and and what i put to is where where is our healthcare infrastructure why are we not prepared for this pandemic because of our i would say arrogance that pandemics are confined only to southeast asia or or these kind of viral infections of uh, epidemics are confined to southeast asia or to africa we are immune the developed world the european countries and america they are immune to this because we are very developed advanced rich we don't get it no covid don't have that restrictions covid don't have that discrimination it 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 goes across so that is one thing we need to think about the preparedness of the healthcare systems for any of these eventualities and uh, and, uh, and 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 that is the kind of take home message for me in that one so and amidst this the psychological distress and this kind of you know isolation uh, and the apprehension what is going to happen more to your family than to yourself and how to you know isolate the kids 
amidst this, you know, you have deaths. And, and COVID has left everybody with some loss. I can't think of anybody who don't know somebody who is close to them who didn't lose their friend or a family member. So one of our friends uh, who was very close, a young man, he died in the, and, 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 and that you don't even go and see him, uh, you can't support the family, you are sick. So these are the kind of uh, things I went through for those 14 days. Um, so luckily we have survived, we have survived it. And, and I, I took uh, another one week off because the weakness is so severe, you lost so much weight. Uh, and at the end of three weeks, I was in a position to go back to work. So I will switch on to the next role as a doctor. Now I'm, I'm kind of donning my doctor hat, my psychiatrist hat, and I have come to see my patients. So I, and one of my wards in the hospitals is an elderly ward. And these are very vulnerable patients. And we are seeing so many deaths of, in this patient group. So, uh, and, and then you join the management in these measures about, you know, isolating them, uh, the, putting all the measures um, and, and trying to do as much as possible to, 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 to make sure that they don't contract this uh, illness. Uh, and there were some challenges, challenges such as, you know, the GP services, because there is this contradictions. There is no you know, kind of unison in kind of, uh, the, the, the approaches. The GP services, whenever you have any physical illness in this country, the first person you think about or you see is a general practitioner. But the general practitioners went remote. They are not coming to the hospitals and they're only operating remotely and that has got its own limitations. And uh, then you have got a two-tier system where all the psychiatrists, we, we got in patients, we are going to the hospital and why can't another set of doctors can't see patients? So this is one of the paradox that again, I don't have an answer, but this is something for us to think about. Uh, then coming to my role as a, a medical director, I mean, some of it resonates the uh, issues raised by Tony Garrity in his uh, last talk uh, as, as a, a medical manager. See, you have these positive cases in the staff and you have, uh, positive cases in the patients. But the biggest problem at that time in April going into early May is lack of PPE. We don't have PPE. Um, we have a small supply and we reserved it for people who are actually you know, positive. And when we are approaching them within two meters, we are using that PPE. And there is sickness in the staff. And, and already, uh, we are struggling to, you know, with the, the, the hospitals, particularly the psychiatric hospitals are having shortages and you have these kind of, you know, additional sickness. Uh, how are you going to cope with it? And then there are some vulnerable staff. The government, uh, what they did was they wrote a letter to all the patients who have these chronic conditions such as asthma or diabetes, whatever they have identified as high risk, they have, they have written individual letters saying that if you have this condition, uh, say uh, so severe asthma or, or some kind of uh, uh, severe diabetes, you cannot go to work or, or you try not to go to work. That was very contradictory in the sense that you get so many of these staff who are otherwise fit and healthy, who are normally doing their work. They say that we got this letter from the government and we don't want to come to work. And, and it already affected a compromised uh, workforce. So what the, the take home point for me here is, there should be some local discretion. You know, the government should not, there should not be very centralized guidelines like, like one size fits all. Um, when, when somebody can still have diabetes, but it is well controlled, they're taking all the precautions. And just because you have a condition asking them not to come to work, will have its own limitations. Then they, we had another ethical dilemma. At that time, the government guideline is you don't need PPE. You should not use PPE unless you're going into uh, the vicinity or within two meters of a COVID patient who has uh, symptoms. Uh, 
but some staff wanted to wear their own PPE. They are buying some PPE from outside. So there is this um, paradox where uh, some people wear and some people don't wear. What should, we, what should we do? So we had an ethics committee and we have to escalate it. And they look at the national picture. They looked at the guide government and we have and and uh, we have to gently advise them not to wear it. Then within a few weeks, then we get a large supply of PPE. Then we insist everybody to wear the PPE. So there is this contradiction. Uh, and, and the other interesting thing is when we are advising people not to wear it because of, uh, you know, to don't to create the two tier system, uh, the science is not, science was still saying that you, PPE protects, although at a government level, at a policy level, it is not the case. So th these, these are the kind of ethical dilemmas we have to come across. There is no solution. There is no easy solution because we don't know the answer. And the other problem we faced at that time was the, the information overload. Usually, whenever we look into any crisis situation, one of the common points we common points of complaint is that there is not enough information. We didn't, we were not informed. But interestingly, with COVID, there is overload of information. There are guidelines coming from the government. There are guidelines coming from you know, Public Health England, NHS England, and you have your own organizer, organization. Uh, and, and it is a kind of an explosion of uh, these guidelines. And uh, some of them are contradictory. Um, and uh, so we just have to have a local committee to process these guidelines and to give them in a form that is understandable, that is, you know, implementable. So that itself was a challenge because if you say something, somebody will quote saying that, no, no, according to that, this is the guideline. What do you say? Yeah, that is true because there are contradictory guidelines. It depends on which one you want to follow. So those are the kind of challenges we I, exam, I kind of faced as a um, medical director. And one of the biggest challenging is supporting the staff, supporting the staff who are coming back to work. And again, my own experience as a, as a patient, you know, who, who came back to work, uh, helped me. It, it really uh, was a revelation to me. And uh, that, uh, that, the, 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 that, you know, you, you, a lot of the times we have this managerial talk for the sake of it, but the empathy based may, will be missing. But I think that is what made me to think, you know, you need to empathize. You need to identify with these members of the staff who could come try and support them, try and help them with their flexible working, try and help them to come gradually. So that th those are the kind of things which we, we were actively thinking to help the people who are sick, to support them in their own homes, because I felt that isolation uh, so you need to uh, ring them. You need to uh, find out how they are doing. You need to see as an organization, well, how you can still support those people who are at home with sickness, uh, whether they have got enough help. Uh, is there anybody to bring the medicines? Is there anybody to drop some food? Things like that. So very simple, but very, very crucial in those uh, times. So we, we had... Uh, I'll talk about it at the end, but you know, we 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 had these expert patient staff where who had COVID, who have written. So we had this little scheme for them to support the patients who are coming back, so that you know, you can say that yeah, I had it. I too went through this. Of course, it won't last long. You know, it will come back. You know, I had these symptoms, but don't worry, uh, it, it will be fine. And also share some of the services. You know, you know, I could not go to the AE in that way, but if you try this way, you may be successful. And do you have a pulse oximeter? Things like this. And uh, staff morale is very important because, interestingly, if you look at the organization, my hospital as an organization, every other organization, the non frontline organizations, they are asking everybody to stay at home. But the frontline workers, you know, the, the, the doctors, nurses, the fire services, and these are the people who are expected to be a lot more than they would in the community, in their workplaces, having more contact with. So, so there is a paradox. It's, it's uh, so, but at the end of the day, all these staff, however they are trained, they are human beings. They have their families. They have their own apprehensions. And this is something they are not trained for. 
this is a pandemic uh, which we have, we we never know all these implications so that is the time you need to support them you need to uh, kind of make the, make them the leaders you know uh, rather than get into that mode of uh, uh, always the, the complainers and uh, there are luckily in our organization there is no uh, major death of uh, healthcare staff but you know in the surrounding organizations and uh, if you look at the you know the in general the the huge proportion of people who are you know uh, succumbing to death from covid or doctors nurses and even more worse is the bma communities the like uh, professor dave has uh, highlighted in his uh, talk last time it's a huge issue people from bma communities are are more vulnerable and it has been established but again if you look at the work forces uh, in the united kingdom uh, particularly in the in the hospitals uh, a large proportion of your staff are from these bma communities so you need this staff to look for to look after the sick but these staff are vulnerable how are you going to deal with this this is the biggest dilemma of course a lot of work has been done by the royal college uh, and uh, uh, dr dave and everybody you know they they came up with some risk assessments these are all very helpful uh then as a as uh, we we had these other challenges like in in the psychiatric hospitals by by default you have patients who are mentally ill who have difficulties and uh, and you expect them to go into isolation for 14 days and even a normal person who is fully mentally well is struggling with this and and within if you are isolating within your own house you have the space but if you are expecting this patient to isolate in his own bedroom for 14 days it is not easy they are uh, not complying with it they want to come into the ward area they want to mingle with others then what are you going to do uh, there is this uh, we in in very severely mentally ill patients we use a a, a, a mechanism called seclusion uh, where we will isolate him for that period to to calm him down and as uh, so in some of the occasions we had to use seclusion but again it is an ethical dilemma you are using it not for mental illness but something else and there is no precedent so th- this is these are the kind of things we experience and uh, the organizations uh, they banned all the visitors um, we are not allowing any leave for the patients and there is loss of face to face contact uh, is isolation loneliness abandonment and all these things will cause embitterment again as uh, professor de souza uh, highlights this point the embitterment within the institutions embitterment from the patients so uh, so so the, 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 these are the kind of uh, things we had to deal with in those initial months and uh, say how did we cope i'm 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 highlighting some of the issues which for for more discussion today uh, but i will also give how we coped as an organization um, i think when you don't know something the best way to deal with that is say that you don't know and and because you are a manager we we need not manage for the sake of management we just need to be honest open and transparent i think that helped in my organization uh we shared especially my experience being as a patient helped me to to do that a bit more uh saying that you know what it is like to be in the shoes of the other person because you were there sometime before and uh, we had daily updates because one of the mechanism we we have we have got a separate ethics committee for the hospital and our organization had a separate ethics committee and one of the aims of this committee is to distill organize the the guidance which are we getting and to make it into very concise and understandable by the top there's no point in sending a long email nobody will read it it has to be two or three bullet points you know please do this do that and this is the guidance and if you need more information of course you can come to us we will uh, anyway we will um, elaborate on that uh, and 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 we said that this is our guidance in this hospital there may be 100 other guidance guidances but this is what we think is best for our organization and when there are any big ethical dilemmas 
uh, we used to escalate it to the higher ethics committee. Uh, and, I, and there is no easy solution. Either way, you can be right, you can be wrong. But when you thought through that process, when you have uh, thought about all the angles, you have to make a decision and, and that could be at least justified in those circumstances. And the other thing which uh, helped in my organization is the visibility. We thought as managers, we, we just can't sit our offices and give these emails and you know say that do this and don't do that. You be on the wards, you be visible. When you're expecting your staff to deliver care in the front line it, with face-to-face -face contact, you need to be there face-to-face. -face. So we made our presence felt in the wards. We sat with them. We, 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 we listened to them, what is happening. And we tried to support them as much as possible. We shared our dilemmas and we shared our own difficulties. So that kind of uh, lateral uh, uh, management where, you know, where it is very horizontal, where there is give and take uh, really helped us. And uh, involving the staff in some critical decisions because unless it is the staff who are going to implement those decisions. Unless they are convinced, you're not going to, those decisions are not going to be effective. So uh, we involved them in, in some of the very critical decisions. For example, we said up front, you know, yes, we, we are expected to wear the mask and everything. We are trying very hard to procure these things, but you know, this is our supply. This is our supply. We, we showed them and what shall we do? How are we going to ration this? How are we going to prioritize? If you use it, all, all, of, all of it, we, this will get exhausted in half a day but we don't know whether we are going to get supplies in the next week or not. How are we going to use our PPE? And that really made everybody to get involved and say, yeah, we shall not use for this, we shall use for this. And, and that is the kind of one of the example. And uh, I talked about being there for the staff, being there for the patients and being trusted, you know, like, you know, they should believe you in these kind of decisions. Uh, and uh, we also uh, instituted flexible working, and we all know about the working from home and all these the electronic media, a lot of these people who need not come to the organization, need not come to the building can work from home. And uh, all these are all, all uh, unless they're all based on the twin pillars of empathy and compassion, uh, the management becomes very dry. You, you should have that human angle. You should, you should believe in what you're doing and people should trust you. Uh, and the final thing which we did, uh, which Tony also highlighted, is the sincere appreciation and thanks. This is very, very important. When somebody went that extra step, make sure that is recognized, make sure you are, you are appreciated and, and uh, that they're recognized. And finally, this is my last slide. Um, so now we just finished our second lockdown in the United Kingdom because they had to go for another lockdown in November uh, to cut down the, uh, you know, because the, cut down the spike. Uh, this time we were very well prepared. You know, the PPE has, is there, people are very well trained uh, and, and it is as if there is no issue. We, 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 we had the same challenges, but people were so mature this time that is it, it is as if, you know, that is a routine, we are used to it. So that is very reassuring because the learning capacity, we should believe in that human ability to, to learn and to adapt. And uh, this COVID is the most destructive natural phenomenon in the last hundred years. I think uh, I stress this point again and again that the preparedness, the, the, the lack of uh, the, the, the lack of vision or the lack of foresight on, on the part of the leaders, our, uh, you know, including ourselves, uh, that the, some of the, something like this is going to come, we should be prepared. As, as I said, uh, you know, when it comes to a war, everybody is prepared for the next minute. They, they, they will give a counterattack. But, but this is something we were completely unprepared for and we need to be prepared. And that the associated point with that is the investments, uh, healthcare investment health, in healthcare promotion, in healthcare equipment, in healthcare staff. This is a big eye opener and people will know. I mean, the, the economic impact, just to give an example, I remember when I was stuck in Jordan, when that uh, Iceland volcano has erupted, 
there were no flights for about you know four or five days they thought the whole world is going to collapse the whole economy is going to collapse and they said you know it it's all gloom and doom but now think about it there are no flights for nearly a year we are surviving so it's not the economy economy follows good health and and it is very important that the healthcare the investment in the healthcare sector should be looked at much more thoroughly and this is the time this is the time for re- reflection and as every uh, as i say every dark cloud has silver lining i think this is the this some there are some good things that are going to come out from this experience uh, i i talked about the investments in healthcare sector and uh, optimization of time and resources at an organizational level at an individual level we were doing so many things which are which are unnecessary right? which we are doing so many travels which are which are unnecessary so uh, now covid has shown us uh, there are a lot of things we need not do but still be happy we can still survive and uh, environment nobody is giving uh, you know that much importance to environment and look at the clean air and the clean water we are experiencing with less human activity and and this is something an eye opener for the future generations this is a warning for us saying that you know you you look after don't don't ignore the nature and just think about the future generations and uh, and also the way we work finally the the way we work um now this is we are in the era of uh, zooms and teams a uh, lot of things for example this conference uh, to actually to have it in in person how much resources how much air travel how much uh, uh, money and uh, resources might have wasted but see with with this kind of uh, uh, webinar we are able to zoom and reach out everywhere in the world the lecture is the same even if i give this lecture in vienna or melbourne in professor disoso's territory this is the same but we are able to do it so economically in a much more uh, environmental friendly way and uh, this is the time to reflect about our own families our own leisure how much time we are we are giving to ourselves uh, how much time we are giving to our own health our own quality of life so i think uh, just i want to end on that note saying that uh, it is it is of course we will be overcoming this uh, pandemic very soon we got the vaccines we are all very well prepared we got the ppes and we are all we are much more wiser now but 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 we should not stop there we should think about what is it we need to do in the future what is that we can learn as individuals as families as communities and as organizations and also as a kind of the whole human kind as a mankind what is the things we have to learn and that is the 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 thing i just want to highlight in this lecture thank you very much Basil, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Giri. Um, uh, it was an excellent uh, personal uh, journey that he took us through. And uh, thank you very much for that. We will have some discussions at the end of this. Um, so can I ask uh, Wesley to come forth? We, uh, um, we are running a little bit behind time, and so we want to... move on and we'll have a discussion with and I'm sure we'll be have questions to ask Dr. Giri uh, with regards to his presentation now uh, i have uh, the pleasure or the honor of uh, introducing the next speaker uh, who is Wesley um, Zafrilis where is uh, is Wesley can you come up to the uh, um, i'm just looking for Wesley to join us I am online. Sorry, yeah. Okay, Wesley, do you want to open your uh, your 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 can you put on your video please? Oh, yes, just a second. Ah, yes. I can't see you. Ah, yes. Oh, I'm going to introduce to you. Uh, yeah. Very nice to see you, Wesley. Uh Wesley is a a fellow of the uh International Institute. He is uh, talking to us from Amsterdam. in the netherlands and i'll take you through um, um, he's also a member of the iopm board and uh, wesley has 
uh, 25 years of experience in the fields of personal and organizational change. He was the mental uh, or the uh, coach of the Dutch women's volleyball team. And in 2017, he received the fellowship of the International Institute of Organizational Psychological Medicine. He is author of a number of books. And in one of his books, in Happiness is Depressing, he describes his groundbreaking coaching method of transforming depression into zest for life. Happiness is Depressing is a step-by-step -step guide for to transform the main causes that he, of depression, which he has identified as loneliness, adversity, negative self-image. Wesley is also the co uh, author of twice nominated book, Meaningful Profit, the best business book for 2011, best management book for 2012, about his applied research on of personal leadership and resilience during organizational transformation. In 2008, he co-authored Appetite, about the mindset of the best chef cooks in the world. So he's a co-developer of the business model, Meaningful Profit, and a faculty member of the Global School of Entrepreneurship and Innovation. He teaches at the uh, leadership at the Niden Road Business University um, in um, uh, Netherlands. Um, Wesley developed the model driven by nature about the essential drives of people. Now, moving from uh, Dr. Sheshagiri's wonderful exposition on his personal journey, we're now coming to, to a very important uh, an area that Wesley is going to take us through stress and relaxation in the workplace. In this presentation, he will discuss key points of his findings and share his experiences in implementing stress prevention and repair programs in organizations. Welcome, Wesley, um, to, the, to the second call, uh, part two of the IOPM conference, and over to you for your presentation. Well, Russell, thank you so much for this wonderful introduction. Lovely to see you again. It's been a while. Lovely to see you too. Yeah, and it's good to see some familiar faces, uh, three cons and some other lovely people that we met, we met around the world. Yes. Uh, I'm based in Amsterdam. I work around the world. Um, it's an honor to, to be on the board of the ILPM. Um, and uh, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present uh, some work that I've been doing for the last, uh, well, it's for, for quite a few years actually. Um, and and recently, in recent years, my sphere of attention changed a little bit because I've uh, I, I gotten some new neuroscientific uh, research uh, I'm basing my work on, which gives me, which gives a, a different angle to my approach. Uh, so in the last couple of years, I've been trying to, let me go, uh, what, you know, I, I work, as you heard, I, I work in businesses and, and with individuals, and it's my, let's say, mission to, 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 to uh, enable the full potential of organizations uh, and individuals. Um, and um, uh, so, so, and I noticed there are some new neuroscientific, uh, there's new, some new neuroscientific evidence on how our emotional brain works, which I think is really interesting. Uh, and I've been trying to transfer those ideas, try to model those ideas into some new thoughts uh, and actual uh, conversational interventional techniques. Uh, so I think I've been doing reasonably well on that. And I'm about to share a little bit uh, uh, of that knowledge with you uh, today. So let me just start the, uh, the slide. You can see the drawing of my daughter, I think, uh, which is a beautiful heart. I got from her. Let me just go for the full screen. And I'm just going to shift this here. Yes. So, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, stress and relaxation in the in a workplace. And I'll, I'll try to stay with the 30 minutes because there's a lot of other interesting information out there for you. Um, 
one of the interesting things when I started to do, let's say, research on stress in organizations, apart from the fact that I already did a lot of work in organizations um, related to stress, I, I, the first things, the first thing that I started to do, I, I started to look for the definition of stress in all the all the textbooks, and and one of the interesting things is that uh, the definitions actually vary quite a bit, um, and then actually it says a lot about uh, about the problem, the problem stress in itself, um, uh, and and uh, because there's a lot of subjective subjective experience in in, in the whole uh, experience of stress. So in the definitions of stress, you, you can actually see that there's a lot of subjective experience. And, and one of the things that researchers are trying to do is they're trying to kind of grasp the whole concept of stress so that we can actually control all the elements of it. And, and there is actually a really interesting problem. So to, 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 to start with some basic definition, let me pause say just a second, yeah. To start with some basic definition, we have to go back to Hans Selye, who actually uh, invented the term stress. And he says it's a non-specific response of the body to any demand for change. And uh, you know, as with the very personal story of our previous speaker, which I thought was really compelling, uh, the uh, he mentioned that you know there's no precedent in this situation, and so there's a lot of there's a lot of change required from individuals. Uh, when there's no precedent, and um, and and in stress, according to Hans Selye, you know it's this non-specific response of the body to any demand for change, uh, and there he, he said, and, and I think it's, it's true, there are two kinds of stress: stress that's negative and synonymous with distress, actually, and you stress, which describes the, the stress needed, the strain needed to perform at your best. And. Um, in a sense, you could say that stress is actually the natural response of the body and mind to demand and threat. Okay, do you mean? Uh, it it aids in our, in our uh, fight or flight reaction to real and perceived danger. At the end of uh, Hans Selye's life, actually, he was so fed up with the term stress. Uh, I, I, I read about that somewhere. Because there were so many different uh, angles to it. And he, he, he actually said, I don't want to talk about stress anymore. I'm fed up with the whole idea. You know, because people, a lot of people have given different definitions to stress, which says a lot about the subjective nature of stress, and which is a really important point. And, and it makes it really challenging to do some really good research on the whole subject. And I want to explain a little bit about stress or change uh, by, by using this analogy of the, of the, the steam train. Uh, I don't have a lot of... Uh, uh, possibility for you to ask questions, but um, you see this wonderful uh, steam train, it's a big beast, you could say, you know, and, and the first steam train in, in the UK actually appeared around uh, 1804 or 1805. And uh, it, it only took 50 years for trains to drive all through Europe and for people to, uh, to, to move from one city to the other. But the interesting thing is, and that's how this actually relates to our previous speaker, to the start of the previous speaker. There was actually no precedent of any experience in the train before the train appeared. But what that means is that, you know, a train, you know, even in those days could actually, you know, go beyond 100 miles an hour. There was no exception. Uh, but in human experience, in the human mind, until the train appeared, there was no such thing as traveling with a speed of 100 miles an hour. Until that time, people were actually traveling by foot or uh, maybe bicycle even, uh, or on a horseback or in a cart or a, or a coach. But the maximum speed would not exceed 20 miles an hour. It was impossible. So the interesting, an interesting thing happened uh, uh, because after a while, when all these trains were running through Europe and the UK, uh, a phenomenon was, uh, was observed, uh, a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, and a book was written about this phenomenon by, uh, I don't know if you know the name, by John Eric Erickson. He was a, a neurologist and a psychiatrist. Um, because an interesting thing uh, uh, appeared. Uh, people got 
ill on trains and not a little bit ill. They really got seriously ill. They had like paralysis uh, symptoms uh, that wouldn't dissipate just like that when they got off the train. Uh, some people really collapsed. There was a, there's a whole, there's a, uh, a lot of stories around that. And he actually wrote this whole book just about railway injuries of the nervous system, which actually says a lot about how uh, profound the, this, these problems were. Uh, and one of the, one of the core uh, diseases of that time was the railway spine. Uh, people uh, got, uh, got paralysis, couldn't walk anymore. Uh, and after some months, that would dissipate. Uh, actually, the interesting thing is that this whole sort of episode of, of railway injuries lasted for about 12 years in the 19th century. And then it disappeared. And uh, you know, it didn't come back again, apart from some uh, uh, travel sickness, maybe. But it's an interesting thing because there was no neurological damage with these people. They didn't have brain injuries or spinal injuries or whatever. So something happened. And if you imagine, something happened in, in, in the whole context of how does our nervous system respond to change? Um, as with COVID, you know, which is unprecedented, uh, it's again, uh, uh, how do we respond to any form of change? How does the brain do that? Well, as I said, there is new neuroscientific research. Uh, and this image is, a, is not the new image, uh, because I think there's, there's some really interesting new ideas, which I believe are very, very true. Um, but I want to explain a little bit about stress and change, uh, what happens in the brain, to, to, to give you an idea. And to, just to give you an idea, if you look at, at my mouse cursor here, you see that this is the frontal lobe, the orange part or the red part, and this is the rest of the brain, the big part of the brain. And so when we are, when there is no uh, stress happening for us, then there's a couple of things that you could say, if you look at the top here, the frontal lobe actually uh, enables us to do some reality testing. And reality testing means that uh, if you look angry at me uh, and, and I'm using my frontal lobe, just you know, to make it a little bit uh, 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 graphic, it, it, uh, then I can actually ask, I can actually ask you, are you angry with me? I can test it, basically. I'm not responding from an emotion. I, I can actually test it. So, and there's when the frontal lobe is active, there's top-down guidance of attention and thought, and which actually means that I can see the big picture. I can, I can use my uh, analytic skills to 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 um, respond. Another interesting thing is there's inhibition here of inappropriate responses, which is helpful because if I, I if I start yelling suddenly, uh, that could be very inappropriate uh, in a situation. So uh, if my frontal lobe is active. Uh, 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 in the classical idea of how the brain works, uh, then those inappropriate tests are needed. And also, my emotions are regulated, which is quite handy. So, all these things are active. And in, in the old idea, or in the classical idea, it says, well, you know, you can actually train the frontal lobe, uh, make it more active. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, you know, is, is actually you know, making a, and training an organization to make a, a large proportion. How can we activate this? Because then all this here will not be active. It, it might be the other way around, actually, which could be interesting. Because in this new, let's say, research, uh, there's actually a statement made that thinking for the brain is actually non, not relevant. Uh, because the brain is actually involved in, 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 in large part, uh, portion in, in some very other activity. So let, let, let's look at the picture when change is actually experienced as stress for a person. Again, in the classical view, the, you, know, you, you all know, most of you probably know the amygdala, which is the, which is the, the, the stress nucleus. Um, again, I can't explain all this now. You, you can read about, about it later, but uh, the, um, in, in new, sci uh, in new uh, neuroscientific research it actually says that amygdala is also responsible for good emotions. So th there's a lot of theory that's, that's going to be, that's, uh, that's uh, how do you say, uh, challenged here. But, but let's just assume for now, for this talk, that 
things work the way they are here. So what happens when change is experienced as stress? Like suddenly you go on a train and this is such a change in your experience that boom, stress is experienced. Well, first of all, you know, things like emotional habits start to appear. And emotional habits are things like, you know, you drink a little bit too much, uh, you, you, you eat the stuff that you don't want to eat. Um, uh, you, maybe you get your, uh, your let's say, your neurotical uh, thoughts uh, come up. And another thing that happens is your emotional reflections, uh, reflexes come up. So your emotional reflexes are your, your emotional response to something. You know, you can get irritated or maybe a bit angry or uh, afraid or something like that. Uh, because these emotional ref reflexes are turned on. And another important one, which I think is a really important one, there are emotional associations, which means that your brain will actually look for other experiences that are related to the experience that, that you have. Yeah? So your brain will generalize and go, will go through your past and look for, oh, this, I, I recognize it, I recognize it, I recognize it. So all these things happen when stress is experienced as change. So I work with, a, as Russell introduced, I, I was the mental coach to the Dutch women's volleyball team. Uh, and I work with a, a, quite a few professional athletes. And one of the things is when, when an athlete gets insecure, let's say when an athlete, like, athlete makes a mistake and feels insecure, you know, what does an athlete normally do to actually deal with insecurities? Well, the, the general approach, which is let's say the frontal lobe approach is they will practice, 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 practice some more, and they will practice, practice, practice until they have a sense of feeling secure enough that they can actually, that they manage the skill and that they can do it again. But the question is, that will help to a degree, but then the question is, will they never feel insecure again? No, because when their circumstances changes, and I've seen that with the Dutch women's vol volleyball team, when the stakes are higher, they get new insecurities. Because when the stakes are higher, something changes in their expectation. So, and then again, they have to train and train and train. And I work with the, with, with the, uh, with the Olympic coach. I work very close with him, with Avital Seligan. Uh, and this is about training and, and they get all these, they get all these athletes in the gym to be strong. And, and of course, all these things help. But there's something at the core that is more fundamental than practice and uh, practice and training. So I have an important question, uh, which I want to ask all of you. Uh, and just think about that for a moment. What do you think is the core function of the brain? If you would just give one answer, you can't give me the answer, but just think about one answer. What do you think is the core function of the brain? In, uh, I, I think that the core function of the brain is to predict what's going to happen. I think our brain is a learning machine, to use that analogy. And our brain is constantly learning through prediction. Let me just give you an example. When I, if I walk up the stairs, my brain is already predicting what needs to happen with my uh, my hip joints, my knee joints, my, my ankle joints. And that prediction comes just before I make the step. And it's really necessary because if that would not be predicted, I would constantly have to reinvent stepping up a trap, uh, uh, stairs again. So let's assume all of us are from Mars, from the planet Mars. We're not from Earth, but our brains are the same as the people from Earth. And let's say our alien ship lands at a tennis court and so we land right in the middle of this of these lines a net there are some rackets and some balls what do you think our brains will predict that's going to happen well it's just like with children you pick up the racket one person goes to the other one side of the net and kind of goes oh there's a ball there's a net there are lines should we just do this so we are predicting what needs to happen now the thing with our brain, this is, just, this is not just a physical thing. We are actually predicting everything that's about to happen. We are predicting 
if there's uh, if somebody's going to reject us. We are predicting if somebody uh, will uh, will acknowledge us. We will. Pre we are predicting that there's safety or not. We are predicting that there's success or not. Our brain is constantly predicting all these things. And the interesting thing with stress, our whole prediction system comes from one particular point. And I haven't mentioned that in the previous slide of the brain, because I talked about emotional reflexes, emotional associations and emotional habits. But I haven't talked about this. If you look at my cursor, you can actually see there's another very specific thing that happens when uh, change is experienced as stress, which means there is uh, the brain is actually guided from the bottom up, which basically means that our neurological attention goes into the body. And our brain is responding to what is happening inside our body. Now, you have to imagine the following. Our brain is, in, in essence, blind because our brain is locked up in a black box. We call our head. You know, this is a black box. It's my head. And our brain is locked up in there. So my brain and your brain cannot check by itself if what you're responding to is actually true or not. So what your brain does, it actually is just monitoring, monitoring what changes inside your body and starts to respond to that. So what happens is the following. If you think of what stress is, if you, if you explain it in this particular way, then there's some kind of change in, in, in your circumstance that creates a change inside your body. But for your brain, what's happening inside your body is really important because your brain needs to manage what's inside your body. So your brain, so let's say if your heart rate goes up or your, 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 your breathing, or you maybe get choked up a little bit, then your, your brain will actually determine what that means. Because in determining what it means, it can actually create an accurate prediction. But the problem is, if our predictions are wrong and from the past, which actually are the, is the only area your brain can create meaning from, from the past and not from the future and not from reality, your brain can only create meaning from the past, then we actually get emotions. And this is a constant loop that we are caught in. We experience something in the body, our brain creates meaning from that. This creates a, a series of predictions and that creates emotions. And this is in a constant loop. But the thing is, this is not a conscious loop. This is an other than conscious loop. So this is just happening all the time and we're not aware of it. And the only thing that we experience it is that something outside of our sphere, sphere of control is actually giving us stress. So that brings me to an important point. You have what we call real stressors, you know, like if somebody attacks you on the street, that, that's a real stress. But we also have something that's called perceived stressor. And the thing with perceived stressor, I, I, I want to illustrate that I once had a client a couple of years ago, a woman who came to my office, was middle, in the middle of the winter, a lot of snow outside, and, and I opened the door and she came in, she walked in, and she, and she said hi, and she already paid online and everything, she paid me a good amount of money, yeah. And she came in, I said hi, how are you doing, blah, blah, and I wanted to close the door, and she had, and, and, and as I was doing that, she said, can you please leave the door open? Which I thought was a really strange request in the middle of the winter, it was freezing. So just out of curiosity, I actually closed the door because I thought if this is so important, this must be the problem. So I closed the door and she freaked out. She said, ah, what are you doing? So I opened the door again and she calmed down. So I said, so what does it mean to you when I close the door? She said, well, it means I'm suffocating, I'm dying. I'm like, well, she's not gonna suffocate. She can actually see with her eyes. I'm a nice guy, I'm not gonna suffocate her. You know, I'm gonna help her, but so the interesting thing is, this is a perceived stressor, but the perceived stress comes from her body. 
she actually experienced something inside her body that is associated by the brain with meaning from the past that actually creates predictions that she will suffocate and that will create the emotion. So the thing is for the brain, they're the same. And actually for the brain, the prediction is the truth. Reality is not the truth. Otherwise she could change that. For the brain, the prediction is the full truth. So what is the core of a repair program? The core of any repair program anywhere is about regaining control. Because the whole issue with stress is that people experience that they don't have any control anymore. You know, they feel that, that control is taken away from them. And that's why they can respond with blaming other people. You are giving me a bad feeling. That whole response is actually has the intention of regaining control. If I can control that response from the other person, then I can relax again. But as you and I know, finding control in the outside world is really difficult because there are so many things to control, especially in a stressful work environment. There are, if you have a team, if you have a, a director, if you have clients, uh, targets. I've got many, many CEOs I work with or management team uh, people, oh, my, my diary is so full, I need to control it. And they can't because external control is not where control is. So a core question is, what can we control? Is it external or internal? And you might guess where I'm going to because if, if this loop actually gives us the impression that we need to find control externally, then the solution has to be actually internally. And, and one of the things that we need to learn people is to find control within. And one of the teachers of finding control within is uh, for me many years ago, uh, I think 25 years ago when I, 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 I read, a, read his work was Viktor Frankl, you know, the, the famous psychiatrist who died in 1996, natural death. He, he was in, quite, in three different concentration camps, I believe. And he made this famous statement. He, he said, you know, he said that in the concentration camps, there were two kinds of people. One, one, kind of, one, of the, one of the kind was, those were the people that were already dead before they came into the camp. And, and, and the other half, they stayed alive until the concentration, uh, until the gas tank uh, chamber door opened. And what he was saying is that all these people were in the same prison, in the same circumstance. They were so far in Poland, they knew they were not gonna be liberated. But he said, some of these people, some of these people, they were already in a prison before they came into the camp. And other people stayed free even when they were in the camp. And he was wondering, how is this possible that some people in the most dire circumstances can keep this sense of freedom? And his notion was that the only freedom that we really have is the freedom to choose what something means for us. So now, Victor Frankl's observations actually merge with new scientific observations, uh, neuroscience observations that the brain actually does a main, has a main function in, in making predictions. That's actually adding meaning to physical experiences. So we are stubborn meaning makers because once we have a meaning, we hold on to it. We, hold, we cling to our meaning. That's why we have arguments and, and tough conversations and even stressful relationships that keep on going and going and going. Because people find it difficult to doubt their meaning making because then, we'll, then their whole, let's say, body, meaning, prediction, emotion loops will collapse and, and, and the brain will not allow that. So there's one circumstance that people will doubt their meaning making is, and that's when they convince that they cannot change the situation they're in. And the concentration camp was one of those circumstances, like we cannot change the situation. I have to change my meaning making. So I, I wondered if, 
Uh, I do repair and prevention programs. I actually develop them. Uh, I, I teach them how to implement them with, uh, with uh, people uh, in, the, in the workplace. But most organizations do not have any plan to deal with stress, even though it's a huge thing that's happening in organizations uh, and with people in general. Because there's this lack of knowledge. They don't know how. When I talk to HR directors and they believe it's very expensive and why should they do it? So a lot of the uh, help comes afterwards when people are actually in burnout or even depression. But that's even much more expensive than doing it the other way around. And I've worked with companies actually in a, uh, our book, Meaningful Profit, we've actually shown that if we, if we create a really good prevention program, then illnesses drop tremendously. 10, 12% is not an exception. So what are the most effective interventions to deal with stress in organizations? Well, in general, you could say that a culture of an organization with a lot of people in stress is part, partly responsible for the stress. So if you are a consultant or a coach or a, or a trainer, you will need to make clear that the culture also need to be, needs to be looked at. Because people don't get stressed just like this. Well, some people do, but most people are part of a culture. And there's a lot of, you know, I teach at the Global School for Entrepreneurship where I teach entrepreneurs to become really effective at what they do. Uh, uh, but one of the things in, in companies is that there's such a focus on making money and getting the targets that all the, uh, 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 all the let's say, personal things uh, and, and things that really matter to people are put aside. But that will create a tremendous cost when people get ill. So you want to look at the culture as well as the individual response to stress. So how do you do that best? Well, I think the most important intervention, and I've been working on creating a lot of models around that uh, in the last couple of years, which I call level two interventions, which is changing the body meaning prediction emotion loop. I think that is the most important thing to do. If you help to change the body meaning prediction emotion loop, which, which is a quite specific thing to do because you cannot suppress the emotions and you cannot just change the predictions because that's frontal lobe change. And we talk about how can you change this emotional response, which I think in my experience is even more effective. So the second thing is you want to do training and coaching on what I call state management, which you want to teach people how to get into the right state. But that is training and coaching, which, is, which you have to do after the level two intervention. And in general, you can do resilience training uh, where a level two intervention can be a part of. So those three things are actually core interventions uh, to add into an organization, any organization, which would be with hospital, hospital staff or a, a business setting. Uh, and I teach in hospitals and I teach in uh, business settings as well. So what does, what, what does the stress meaning emotion loop and prediction loop actually do? Well, it creates predictions about many different things. It creates prediction about, the, about your future. Will it be all right with me? Well, things will be all right. It will create predictions about ourselves. Can I do this? Am I worth this? It will create predictions about relationships. What do others think of me? Will they still like me? It will create prediction about security. What will I lose? Will I keep my job? It will create predictions about your home. What will my partner think of this? What, will my kids be okay? It will create predictions about investment. What should I, what would I need to learn? And am I willing to make all that investment? It will create predictions about self-efficacy. Can I deal with all this? It will create predictions about wariness. Do I want to change all this? And all these insecurities manifest themselves in resistance from people. People who are stubborn, hold on, holding on to their habits. They don't want to make changes. They want to keep on doing what they do. They want to push others away. They, they, they think in yes, but language. Yes, but I can do it like this. They hold on to trusted ways and ideas. Procrastination is an important symptom. 
Blaming is an important symptom. Emphasizing objections and problems is an important symptom. So the famous author Mark Twain, who lost his leg, I think, in the American Civil War, and a lot of friends in those American the American Civil War, made his had as, as stated this famous quote. He said, I, "I've had so many disasters in my life, and some of them actually happened." And that is actually what stress is. It's a subjective experience of this body meaning prediction emotion loop that we are in. It's not an objective experience because people have different create bit different meanings to their physical experiences and they have different past experiences. And so when they, when people start to predict we cannot say, well, this causes stress, so this prediction is always true. No, it's a very individual thing. So if you're interested in learning more about this, in my latest book, I actually, uh, this is the person that Russell actually mentioned, uh, I, I describe non-therapeutic coaching interventions for depressive thoughts and feelings. It's available on Amazon, and you can look at it on my site. Uh, uh, because I felt there was a need for a non-therapeutic approach. So uh, looking at how can you actually intervene uh, with coaching methodologies, which are based on goals, uh, uh, and how can, can that be helpful? And at the moment, I'm actually doing research on the effectiveness with, of my approach with one of the Dutch big uh, insurance providers, like uh, the English NHS, uh, because uh, it seems that when I work with the depressive people in organizations, uh, we were able to half time the recovery rate, which is really interesting. Uh, so we, we, at the moment we're measuring the effectiveness of these interventions. And I'm really curious, it's gonna take a year to, to get all the information. I'm really curious to, to, to see what the effect of that, of that is. So, but I'm describing some of this stuff in my book. Um, and if you're interested in, uh, I want to learn more about how to change this body meaning prediction emotion loop. I've done a, a lot of research in the last couple of years and worked with a, and developed a lot of models that I've actually just now been presenting. So I'm really honored that I can present that here as well. So if you want to know more about that, you can contact me or, or if you want to set up, if you want to know how to set up prevention and repair programs in organizations, uh, I've got a lot of experience with that as well. Or if you want to know about advanced non-therapeutic coaching interventions or my book, Happiness is Depressing, please visit me on my website, vasilisofidus.nl. There's an English page as well. Or send me an email on info at vasilisofidus.nl. I'm very willing to share information. I teach around the globe. Uh, I teach online all these, uh, all these ideas. So I hope this was uh, interesting for you. I hope this was informative for you. Uh, I believe that there's a lot of a lot to be gained uh, in uh, stress prevention and repair programs, and the ILPM can definitely make a, a make a big contribution there worldwide. Uh, uh, so don't be afraid to drop me a line. Um, I will answer any question that will come around. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Wesley. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, very nice, very excellent presentation. Uh, indeed, I'm sure that um, this will be very helpful to, to many of our, our, our um, participants of this uh, conference. Certainly, we'll have some discussion at the end uh, as we are running um, a little late. So we, we have a time for that. Right now, um, uh, so thank you, Wesley, once again. And let me now uh, introduce to you our next speaker, Dr. Pratiksha Patel. Dr. Pratiksha Patel for, is from the United Kingdom. And she is currently the head of analytical microbiology, stability, and product chemistry at the GlaxoSmithKline um, GSK Consumer Health with 
20 years of leadership, various leadership experiences at GSK and Procter and & Gamble, and of course, uh, Dr. Reddy's Laboratories. She holds um, a basic, uh, of, uh, she's a microbiologist and a virologist from the University of Warwick and a doctorate in biofilm research from the University of Birmingham. And uh, Dr. Pratiksha Patel has worked at various leadership roles, managing large teams at, at the global level. And she has, a, her passion includes mentoring and coaching talented individuals to enhance their leadership skills. She, she reflects on her experience of managing multiple departments in various locations. This has enabled or allowed her to understand factors affecting team motivation and performance. Today, she's going to speak and enlighten us on what she has uh, learned, essentialism and prioritization as, an, as a key to success for leaders as well as their teams. Not only does she, she, she reports that not only does it enhance their performance and the performance of the team, but it also reduces workplace stress and disengagement and she has applied various tools for essentialism at the workplace. And of course, this is the key of what she's going to be presenting uh, uh, today in her, uh, uh, her talk, Essentialism and Prioritization, in particularly in uh, leadership for successful leaders. Uh, a welcome to you, Dr. Pratiksha Patel, and uh, I'm delighted that you're here and going to uh, take us to this very interesting and important um, uh, uh, area, particularly if we, for all of us in leadership and management roles in the various areas uh, that we come from. Over to you, Dr. Pratiksha Patel. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, uh, Professor Russell. Uh, it has been my pleasure to come here and join this, uh, uh, this group. I have heard so many wise and insightful uh, topics in this uh, series. Uh, first session was wonderful. This session, uh, second session as well, uh, we have a really prominent speakers. Uh, Professor Vasily and uh, Dr. Sashagiri has really given an insightful talks around this topic. Uh, so I'm hoping that my talk will really add into the concept they are actually introducing as well. Uh, so in today's talk, what I am talking about is the concept of essentialism. Uh, let me just share my screen and let me know when you can see it. Uh, Excellent. Uh, so this is more about uh, my personal journey. Uh, at the same time, I'm actually always a lifetime learner. So various things I learn from the books, from individuals I experience, come in contact with, uh, and overall by also making mistakes as a human being. So these are the areas which I will actually introduce to you. And uh, more I would like to really discuss during the discussion session about how do we actually underpin the concept of essentialism in the workplace? Because I think it has a direct impact on individuals' performance, motivation, and their uh, mental health as well. Um, so when I look at the modern workplace today, um, what are the current challenges which we are facing today? We all know that the accelerated space which is at workplace is unbelievable. Uh, we All the work which is really in the 1970s, 80s, we used to have memos, 
files on our desk. Uh, we used to have a landline phone calls. Things were much calmer. Now we have video calls, emails, virtual documents. Things have become really fast. Average individual at the workplace will receive about 126 emails a day. So just imagine how do we respond to that? And no, we don't. We only respond to 25% of them. Uh, technology in the workplace has really helped us in a way. We have, we have become a very global, um, globally reached individuals. We have connection like for this example, this conference, number of audience from globe has joined us today. But at the same time, it has introduced very high number of tasks per person. Ironically, we are spending a lot more time at the workplace, but our productivity is decreasing. And this is the, the reason why it is decreasing is because individuals actually switch between the tasks. 40% of our time, estimated time, is taken over by just the switching activities, not by doing the task which is at the hand. And this is where I think the, uh, this concept really comes in. So previously, the workplace nine to five individuals has a less task to do. They were working on a, a local collaboration uh, way, while now it is your emails can be accessed 24 seven. It's only the click or swipe away based on the tire type of devices you use. And all of this has really resulted in workplace stress, fatigue and disengagement. In addition, just to make things worse is our performance management system. It always annually rates people. In a society, we all want to be the best and people are changing assignments. And Professor Vasil just mentioned, every time a stakes goes high, the footballer reported higher stress level. They didn't know how to cope with it. What they acquired at one level was not straight away applicable in the second level. Similarly, in the workplace on average, uh, I have personally changed assignments every two years. So that is a completely new teams, new areas, new companies you are joining. And this is all uh, accumulated into having that higher stress level in the workplace. Now coming to COVID situation, what Dr. Sashagiri just mentioned, uh, completely unprecedented pandemic, which we have all experienced as a leaders, and personally for me as a global leader, we were going through the integration with the Pfizer Consumer Health. We had a major recruitment uh, uh, efforts which were undergoing. A uh, lot of laboratory equipments were being bought. Uh, I managed, by the way, the four different technical functions globally. So there was a lot of areas which needed to happen and COVID came and changed everything. So there were a lot of uncertainty to manage. At the same time, the individual levels, uh, what uh, Dr. Sashagiri was mentioning, is that they, which space they were at as well with their themselves and their loved one at home as well. So some of them were providing care, some of their family members were affected. So this is all created a lot of stress. And personally, if I look at, uh, you can see the diagram on, this, uh, on the right, I found myself as a, pulled into a number of different directions. So the stress is not just the something happens to others. It, I personally experience time to time as well. So what is essentialism? So essentialism is a concept uh, that when the workplace is pulling us in a different direction, how do we actually pursue on focusing on our key priorities? Rather than it acknowledges our limit as a human being, we cannot do everything. It is more about one priority at a time and making a bigger difference on that area. There's a famous book called uh, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less by Greg McCord. No, whoever has not come in contact or are, are familiar with it, I would highly recommend you to read this book because it really talks about the concept of doing more is not good. <laughs> doing less is actually more effective. And one can, highest form of contribution can only be made if you channel your time and effort into those uh, one area at a time. Now, when I read this book, I was very energized and I thought I will definitely want to practice this in my workplace, in my role. So I came back and I thought, does it work in my real life once I bring the essentialism in, in my workplace? And 
as many of us, I also have a set number of expectations in my role and I have to do them all. And I cannot just drop and choose what, and what I want to do. So when I look at the essentialism, I realize that managing these multiple priorities, deadlines, those endless meeting invites, these are all essential, but I have a choice. I don't have to do them all. And I also have a choice on when and how I will do those things. So focus on of my presentation today is about that essentialism concept and how I have made the applicable uh, concept at workplace and the approaches I have taken over the years, which has given me a good success overall. So three areas I will talk about. So there are three steps of essentialism in workplace. The first one is about exploring. It is very, very important to understand that what are my critical priorities? What is the, the organizational uh, expectations for my role? And that must be delivered. This is the area which we must know completely well. And then the second thing you need to know, understand is yourself. So what are my unique skills? What are my style and factors which motivates me and brings the best out of me in the workplace? So one must look at the both goals of the organization, but this, uh, we work for at the same time our, our skills and ability and actually identify that how can I add the maximum benefit for the organization I am working for? And how do I develop my staff in a way that they are working to their best possible self as well. So this is the area some of you might be familiar with, but I came across, uh, nobody really knows who authored this uh, concept, but it is about the rocks, pebbles, sand story. So the big rocks represent your big, big priorities, both at the organization and in your prior personal life as well. So these are the areas which will really add the values. Now the small pebbles are the areas which are uh, priorities, but they are not as big. They are not, they are essential tools, but they are not there to really help you deliver something which you are really, really there to do. So for my example, my role, understanding consumer safety and understanding regulatory requirements in the drug development, because we work in research and development is really, really important. It is one of my pebbles. If I can't do that, it can threaten the viability of the company by having a negative, um, uh, negative consequences on patients. So I really need to understand and underpin the regulatory uh, compliance in my role. So this is my pebble, but it's not my biggest delivery. It is not the technical functions which I'm leading is biggest delivery, they are enablers. So ensuring I understand those areas very well. And then the last one is the sand grains. Sand grains are the routine activities. Something really nice to have, something which is essential as well, looking through the emails, identifying what is important, what is not, uh, having routine maintenance activities. These are all little, little sand grains which we must have as well. So if, I, if you look at this picture on your left, uh, the first chart is about, if you put the sand grain first, then your pebbles, then there is no room for your big rocks, which are your big priorities. However, if you refer, reverse that and put your big rocks first in the jar, followed by your routine maintenance activities, which are really, need, really needed, could have a negative uh, consequences later. And then sand grain fills in the rest of the space, which is available to, in, in that jar. And if you look at that jar as your capacity, and this is how you distribute it, I think this is the most way of getting the success without feeling stress. I, I have used this uh, approach time and time again with my teams as well and helping them understand what are their big priorities as well and which is really, really effective for them as well. And it has allowed all of us to become uh, more effective at prioritizing as well. So once we have explored, I think this is very important. Once we have explored and identified those, understanding those priorities and clearly clarifying that with the stakeholders is also very, very important because your stakeholders are the one who is going to see or view how things are, uh, how you are delivering things as well. 
So your big priorities are also aligned priorities too. Now, when, when I practically started doing those things, then clearly there was a question on what do I stop? What do I eliminate? I have identified my big priorities. There are my big rocks. Now I need to, to focus my energy on this. I need to stop something. And this is very, very difficult for a number of individuals. What do you stop? And a uh, lot of people struggle with it because the human psychology, basic human psychology is that we don't want to not please anybody. <laughs> we want to please everyone. We don't want to say no to anyone. And I have also personally suffered that as well, that I want to be nice, I want to help, and I want to say yes. So I, I think this is taking us away from saying no, and this is where the problem uh, lies. So for us to say no gracefully is very, very important. And what I really started doing is that communicating my big rocks to other, so others. So when I talk to them about their priorities or their ask of me and I'm saying no, they fully understand. And quite often you actually go and give them a solution. You are not able to help them in this instance, but there are people or areas which they can re, uh, refer to as well. So it's about saying no gracefully, but at the, way, at the same time collaboratively so you are still keeping that good work-life uh, work balance and you have a good connections at work as well. Bias to watch is that sometimes being busy makes you feel important. You, I, I recall when I first joined uh, Procter & Gamble and my manager used to mention that he only needs two and a half hours sleep and he is here more than 12 hours. And listening to all of this was really, really stressful for me. I had a child and I didn't know how I'm going to manage long hours and care for, uh, for my daughter as well. So I think what I slowly learned over the years is that being at workplace is not that important. As long as you are productive and you are delivering or delivering your goals, it doesn't really matter how many hours you fit your, uh, or, uh, your work in. You also need to understand that the work you are doing, is it your priority or somebody else's? So I always ask my team, whose objectives are you delivering to? Is it your objectives or somebody else's? And I think our, our, our need to please everybody, we need to really overcome that as well. Sometimes honest, transparent discussions are better uh, than really saying yes and not delivering or under delivering basically. And then finally, once you have identified, you have eliminated is about execution. And execution is the key. Uh, how do you actually create that platform of effortless execution? And I have come across a number of different areas and this is the area I have to go back again and again and revise, refine as things are changing. But first thing to do is really planning your activities with a focus on delivery. So not just to ticking the lines in your to-do list, but really identifying how much it has shifted the needle towards my big objectives. Then having a routine really helps. People as a human beings, many of us are just bound to our routines. So you, once you have a routine, you can take advantage of your productive time and not so productive time. So if you are looking at emails, identify your non-productive time and do that during that time having a set routine of starting, having even working from home in this COVID situation, having that routine where I come to this study and I start my work, uh, it, it is very, very important. Um, other thing we also need to do is really understanding the energy level throughout the day as well. Quite often, I am really surprised how people skip the lunches or the small snacks and how their energy level drops as well. So physical energy, mental energy, these are all the dimensions of energy which we really need to un, uh, see within ourselves and identify how do you keep that up? How do you sustain yourself throughout the day so you remain in a more productive state? And as a leader, lead by example. At, at times, I actually tell my teams that we need to finish your work by 5.30 in the evening 
And then if I am still doing the emails at eight o'clock in the evening, it's not leading by example. So as a leader, really lead by example. That is okay to switch off. It's okay to take, take the time off at the weekend and not respond to your, to your emails. And then the last one is about really identifying what are your productive blockers personally for you and your teams as well. So talking to them, informally, especially during this COVID-19 where I'm not physically present on the sites, I'm not traveling, generally 30 to 40% of my time I'm traveling to different sites and meeting them. I am calling a virtual coffees with those team members to fully understand how they are feeling, what is making them stressed, what is helping them, what is motivating them. So it's really having that understanding with your team to identify what is blocking their productivity and how you can enable them as well. So one of the important tool I have found, and I'm gonna highlight this here, is for prioritization matrix. And uh, some of you might be familiar with it. Is the, it is the Eisenhower's uh, prioritization matrix, which looks into the two dimension, uh, the urgency of the task and importance of the task as well. And I have really, I mean, lived through this uh, four quadrants all the time. So I constantly look at my work areas, my team's work area, and try to manage this uh, really well. This talks about that as you begin your day, uh, you really need to understand uh, priority one is about the urgent task which has come to you, which are very important as well. So scanning your email, 125 emails, to identify what are that urgent things. So you have to have a mechanism in which you will get to that urgency very quickly. Then you need to really take that, take time out for that, manage and uh, deliver on that. What I have learned, so some of the areas which I'm mentioning, this is my own take on it, is how do I manage and change those? So why those urgencies are happening and why, what can I do? So before it becomes urgent, it is done. So reducing that crisis by proactive planning and pushing them into the second quadrant, which is non-urgent and important, is, is the ideal place to be. This, non, uh, this quadrant is your most productive quadrant, I would say, and that's why I put this blue ring around it. It is the one to really focus on. That is the area which is not urgent. Uh, you Psychologically, uh, you are stimulated to deliver what you can really deliver because your capability is hampered the minute there is urgency. While if you are calm, you are collective, you are strategically planning, then your execution is also higher. So focusing on this priority too is the, is, uh, and I would like to spend at least 60, 70% of my time in that quadrant. And also identify how can you now proactively plan to make more and more areas coming towards that. This last one, uh, which is the priority three, which comes under that they are, they are really urgent, but they're not as important for you, but it is important for the organization. And this is the area where you really need to delegate. And there's a big watch out here. I mean, some of the management training uh, I have seen there where they talk about there's something which is not good enough to take your time, delegate it out. No, that's not the case. Delegate with, uh, with care. Delegate to make sure that you understand the person you are delegating to, it is developing them and they have the skill sets to deliver as well and oversee them, help them. So delegate is not that something unimportant you delegate. A delegate is that is important for the organization and it is important for their levels and their capability. So this is, this is one area which I have mastered over the years and number of techniques I have put in there uh, making sure there's appropriate training in place for them to deliver, making sure it's not resulting them in uh, stress as well, because these are urgent. Anything which is urgent actually results in stress, stressful situation, and, uh, and really helping them and motivating them. Uh, and then the last one is eliminating. So this is something which is non urgent and non important. It doesn't take a brain for us to understand why, why we would we do that? I mean, who would do that? But when you carefully look at our own schedule, you identify there are things which are eliminated. They are neither urgent nor important, but we all do that. Internet browsing, social chatting, gossips in the workplace. These are all these areas which are neither important nor urgent and still people spend so much time in that quadrant. And some of these people do use it as a stress buster. So I think this is the, also the area to watch out for as well because we do need a downtime. 
but the main focus should be that it should not be a gossip. It shouldn't be, it should be a connection. It should be a meaningful connection to your friends or your colleagues where you are actually nurturing each other. You are helping each other. It could be a venting opportunity for you, but in a more productive manner. So utilize those areas which are non-urgent and non-important, but only if they are stress buster and put a timing to it. So when I want to vent out certain things or frustration to my trusted colleague or a friend, I would put a timer saying 10 minutes I'm going to talk and at 10 minutes the timer will ring and you say, thanks thanks for listening to me. I now took it off my chest. I feel better now. And then move on to your productive uh, priority two areas. There is also one uh, really good book which has really helped me over the years as well. Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of uh, Highly Effective Individuals which talks about this concept in very much details. And there are seven habits that are really, really important, which I have implemented in my workplace as well. So I would also uh, recommend you if you want more information on this topic of prioritization. So final slide. Uh, so what are the top tips for success when it comes to the prioritization? It's about making their strategic choices with courage and aligning it with the stakeholders. Uh, it's about identifying what is taking too much of my time? What is making me unproductive? And really have that discipline in your time and effort, how you are managing that into day-to-day -day work. And it is about really clarifying priorities for your team and eliminate the ambiguity. And this is very, very important. Many leaders are really good at motivating and they tell the teams, you are wonderful. You can do this, go, go and do this. But then when people ask, do what? They said, anything, <laughs> that is not good enough. This is not gonna create your team in the success. Uh, it's not gonna deliver the success for your team. So really, really understanding what is that success looks like and really telling them and clarifying them that with their team is very, very important. And last but not least is that most of the people feel stressful also when they are not given any feedback or not recognized. So make sure you take time out to celebrate achievements for your organization and your individual team members as well. Give them a feedback. Even the negative feedback is better than a no feedback. So when, when you ignore somebody, they are very disengaged. So make sure that there is a time take now to give that feedback, positive feedback, negative constructive feedback, but at the same time celebrating the achievements as a team as well. So with that, I would like to say thank you very much for listening and inviting me to this forum. Um, and over to you, uh, Professor Russell. Thank you, Dr. Pratiksha. Thank you very much for this very enlightening talk, particularly for people who are managing uh, leadership and managing teams and trying to uh, um, um, get things done. I think the concept of essentialism and prioritization is certainly a key to success for a good leadership. And um, having said that, we've had now three of these, uh, the first portion of uh, the uh, conference uh, uh, today completed. And it's now uh, my pleasure to thank all the three uh, uh, excellent speakers and we will now move into uh, a, a, a bit of a discussion. I will ask um, uh, Professor Shrikant to take that role on. Is that all right with you? Th thank you, uh, Professor Razan. So th thank you for wonderful presentations. Um, and I request the audience to post questions um, I already received some questions, so please uh, share them on chat box if you have any questions to ask to any of the speakers today. But firstly, I would like to invite um, Professor Dr. Baliga, who is a, um, a research doctor in the, in, in, in the Manipal Institute of um, Oncology. He has been doing research and sharing his research at IAUPM for some time. Is one of his areas of interest is healthcare management, but in particular, he is working on areas of psychological medicine in the areas of power nap and music in terms of mitigating stress at workplace. So he wanted me 
to invite him to share some of his insights uh, for a brief time, maybe for five minutes. So I invite him to join us and share some of his insight in the area of power nap, please. Actually, Dr. Balika is, is, is a fellow of our institute. I, is a fellow of our institute. Dr. Baliga, are you there? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Srikant, and uh, thank you, Dr. Russell. Uh, I would like to say that uh, there's one small correction. I'm from Manlo Institute of Oncology, not from Manipal Institute of Oncology. Um, and I came in into this organizational psychology uh, through Dr. Russell, because when I was in uh, my former in uh, institution, uh, Dr. Russell had, and when I was pursuing my master's in psychology, uh, Dr. Russell told me to take up uh, this organization psychology as a sub specialization during my course in uh, psychology, which I was doing with Manasa. And uh, I researched into organizational psychology with the guidance of uh, Dr. Russell. And in fact, the power nap study was uh, suggested to, to me by Dr. Russell. Uh, and uh, oncology, in oncology, the uh, healthcare professionals go through a lot of stress. In fact, it's one of the most stressful fields in uh, healthcare sector. And uh, this, we had to look at how we can mitigate the stress in uh, healthcare workers working in oncological setup. So at that point of time, we did one small pilot study at the Manual Institute of Oncology with the power nap, which was a single arm study. And we observed that power nap reduces stress immensely in the healthcare workers. Now, after this, then we went in into another one aspect that is how about if music is kept and when the person is working and that also uh, of the results are getting tabulated and we see that there's an immense benefit of uh, a healthcare worker listening to music because music is known to reduce the stress and these are things which doesn't interfere too much with your work but at the same time gives you so much of uh, relief that it helps you out last for a longer time in your work schedule. And especially when you take, say, when I say about power nap, there's a lot of misconception when someone goes in for a, a, a takes a power nap. People think there's, he's sleeping or she's sleeping. No, it's not that. It's power nap is completely different wherein you just close your eyes, just switch off everything in your mentally and just relax for some time. And it really gives very good benefit. In fact, even 10 minutes of power nap gives immense benefit and it helps you to work for a longer time. In fact, in some institutes in Korea, they have made it mandatory that power nap has to be there in their occupational uh, schedule so that you know it gives them the benefit of going for a longer time. I would just like to stop my observation and I would like to thank the IOFTM for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Russell, as well as Dr. Shrikant. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Dr. Thank you. So I have some questions. Uh, the, some of the participants are asking questions to the speakers. So we have Dr. Radhakrishna Rao posing a question to Dr. Zafris. Um, Dr. Radhakrishna Rao, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Dr. Radhakrishna Rao? Okay, we'll come back to him in a minute. Um, so I'll, I'll go back to the speakers and and just I'm wondering if any of the speakers has any insights insights to share about the talks from the other speakers or any questions they want to ask the fellow speakers. Dr. Radha Krishnan wants to be unmuted. I'm not sure where where is he's asking to be unmuted. To the left bottom corner. But we had made him co-host, so if you can hear us, sir, you can unmute yourself. Or if you can switch on your video for a minute, you may come to the front and we'll be able to do it from here. Okay, he'll join us in a minute. Any other speakers has any questions for the fellow speakers? Uh, Dr. Radhakrishna, you are unmuted now. You may speak. Yeah, thank you, uh, Derek. Uh, this question is for uh, uh, 
the stress part what we were discussing uh, is there any uh, stress which is good uh, and if uh, is there any stress amount of stress or the type of stress which is good or any kind of stress is bad that was my question do i answer yes yeah. yes uh, well you know, uh, thank you for the question um, as hans selly said you, there's also use stress which actually is the, is the level of tension that you need to perform uh, but the question is again it, it comes down actually comes down to the to defining because uh, as stress is a subjective experience once the meaning of the physical experience in the body becomes negative then it's then it, then stress is problematic so as long as the meaning has some positive connotation the, the stress can actually be helpful so let me give you an example um uh, i uh in 2004 uh i was working in san diego uh uh, uh with uh, beach volleyball players for the Olymp in preparation for the olympics uh and then one of these beach volleyball players made an incredible remark because he actually talked about two separate levels of of meaning when you think about it so he, uh so he won a very important game and uh and a, a speaker came up to him and said oh, i don't know his name anymore so i call him john he says so john you must have been nervous and nervous in essence could could cause nervousness in the body could cause stress so he he made this wonderful remark which actually completely correlates to what to what I, i talked about he said well i was nervous which is one level of meaning you know the experience in the body and then he said well but i was calm about it which is the next level of meaning so he says he responded with calmness to the nervousness so in that sense when you think about it when you're calmly nervous think about the state that you get into yeah but if you get let's say angry nervous which is a different reaction you know if you get angry nervous you 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 your your state is completely different so this is about good stress is about how you respond to what's going on in your body with 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 the quality of the meaning that you have available for you is is, is that does that does that make sense yeah yeah absolutely i mean that's what i was actually uh, waiting to hear uh there's definitely something uh, good about stress uh, that's what we have been learning and i just wanted to reconfirm it with you as an expert thank you thank you for that thank you so much so does anyone in the audience have any more questions to the speakers or you want to share any insights about any of the talks that you have heard so far Uh, there was a question from uh, dr joseph philip raj uh, so if you can just uh, ask your question i'll try and unmute you also notice that there are some questions in the chat box uh, about stress uh, I, i'm willing to answer if, uh, if please, please please if you if you spotted any questions that are relevant to you please go ahead and respond to them please okay so uh, and please interrupt if you have a question so uh, because it's really interesting this um how to deal with no uh, how can we deal with a toxic person in the workplace is it necessary to give him or her the insight well this is an interesting thing because to to understand that statement uh, first of all you know in order to find somebody toxic we have to label that person as toxic which is a, is a meaning we give yeah so so first of all we have to label the person as toxic and actually once you start to label something as toxic or somebody is toxic you probably will respond with uncomfortable physical feelings because that's logical because it's not toxic it has the meaning of not nice so so your physical response will already be stressful so 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 that is one so so first of all i i i'm interested in the linguistics of it this as well because linguistics is related to meaning 
Um, so, 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 so naming, naming toxicity as a cause will actually do something with you. The other thing which I find interesting in the question is that, uh, well, is, it, is it necessary to give him or her the insight? Well, one of the problems with stress, one of the problems is that our brain actually makes up that the, that the origin of the stress is external. So therefore we look for external control and actually, you know, uh, talking to the other person is about regaining external control, but the fact what would happen if the person does not respond to you? That is, could mean that you could even be more stressful or feel rejected or whatever. So in a sense, you could say you could actually, uh, in a sense, it could be more interesting to look at that loop of meaning making you do yourself. Uh, which is more effective than actually controlling the external environment. So I hope that, that that's helpful. And uh, if I may add uh, on this comment, you are absolutely right. I think internally, how do we deal with this, these people or individual is very important. At the same time, having that compassionate view of that person as well. So what is really causing them to become toxic as well? Quite often there are reasons behind it as well. Of course, there are personality, but then there are, this person is going through a journey and experience which has made them toxic as well. And never ever really look at the person as a person, but also their behaviors. So when you, when I get engaged with those members, when after certain HR complaints I've been raised, I have to deal with those people. And it's more about not as a person, but about the behaviors they exhibit and how others are interpreting that behaviors as well. So making them aware, but with a, in a more gentle and compassionate manner is very, very important. Can I respond to that? Because I think you're, it's very true what you're saying uh, and very valid. The interesting thing with the emotional brain is, is that it's very difficult to get out of your own loop and look for compassion. So once you're in, once you're in this physical meaning prediction response, so I work with a lot of couples in relationship crisis. And I, you know, I teach them all these things, one of the things that you talked about, but when push comes to shove, when there is emotion, it becomes really difficult to look at good intentions and really challenging to look at the good of somebody's behavior. So because people are caught in their own prediction loops and they say, ah, you're doing this to me. And then it's gonna be really difficult. So I totally agree with you. And, and, and at the same time, I think it's also important to, to how can we uh, intervene in this prediction loop on a very personal level? I, I think we, uh, there's a prediction, what you said makes sense because our first talk uh, uh, with the, um, Tony, the CEO, he spoke about this uh, in his leadership as a CEO dealing with this, but I think uh, this comes back to a lot of work done on compassionate leadership. Um, there's a good amount of evidence and work there on, on that part of uh, compassion, compassionate leadership. And he spoke about dealing with the whole organization of a hospital as the CEO, bringing in this compassion and, 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 um, um, and empathy. I think that that certainly is an important part. I'm sure Tony must be here. Uh, I think I saw him here earlier, Tony Gitli, who's a fellow and who was the first speaker, um, or you know, at least in the first day, a speaker on this very area. Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, can I ask now? Hello? Hello? Yes, who's that? You can please go ahead, Dr. Philip. I, Dr. Philip, I have oh, yeah. one. I've been fair to all of all the speakers. I got one question each for uh, all of them. Now, let me start with, uh, since the discussion was going on toxic person to Dr. Vasily. Now this toxic person, it is your feeling towards the other person. You think he is toxic to you. When you do introspection and see why is he toxic to me? Or is it the same thing with everybody? Is it the situational reaction and the interpersonal 
uh, communication or lack of it, which causes this so-called toxic person? Good question. Uh, actually, in the objective world, there are obviously people who can be really nasty <laughs> because that's just the reality of life. Um, however, as I'm learning more and more about the, the fundamentals of this e emotional prediction loop, um, in the last couple of years, I've, I've worked with a lot of individual clients and uh, I've started to come to the conclusion that actually most of our labeling is actually projection of our own meaning making. So we actually call something something because we have experience with that in our own lives. And as our brain looks for emotional connections and generalizations, it will actually build upon our past experience because that's the only experience the brain actually has to refer to. So, uh, so uh, when, I, when I work with, with couples who can actually become really toxic with each other, for example, uh, uh, it, it turns out, at least until now, so I'm curious to, to see what will happen in the next couple of years, that the things that they are saying about each other are actually projections of their own meaning making. So uh, it made me thinking about all this and made me even more has given me even more insight and even compassion for individual uh, suffering actually because it makes me aware that this loop is 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 a neurological loop and you know so it doesn't mean that we are that we need to suffer within the loop and and we cannot do something if you understand how it works you can actually find ways to intervene there but but we're, we're all built in this way, I believe. So this actually has, has given me such a deep, a, a deep compassion, even for, the, for terrible things people tend to do. Uh, so, so yes, there is something going on in the outside world. And obviously, there are, there are people who, are really, uh, who do damage. They are around, sadly enough, but they are. It's a fact of life. But within, the, let's say, the normal uh, bandwidth of interconnecting and, and, and experiences that people can have in relationship and crisis and everything that can happen, most of the things that we attribute to others are projections of our own meaning making. I think it really makes sense. Now, uh, the question to you is, stress or reaction to the stress is quite individualistic. It two people cannot have same type of reaction to particular stress. Now this called uh, the reaction to this particular stress, can it be modulated over a period of time, at least during the developmental years? Please, can you tell us this question is to Dr. Talk Zappos? About Vasily only. Stress oh, and, uh, oh, I thought you. I thought you would. You asked somebody else. Could you please repeat, repeat the question? Okay. Now the uh, reaction to the stress mm -hmm. is quite individualistic. Yes. I mean to say that two people cannot have same type of reaction to particular stress. Mm -hmm. Now this reaction or to stress can it be modulated or sort of you know uh, made less reactive during the course of development, especially in the teenage and in the, uh, you know, adolescent time? Is it, can it be modulated? Exactly, yes. Uh, actually, our, uh, our meaning making start, starts from the moment of conception, basically. So we, we get, uh, we are, let's say smothered in meaning. Let, let me give you an example. Uh, you know, you can have parents who argue or, or you can have parents who don't touch each other. Uh, 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 and, uh, all the experiences that you have around you, which are verbalized, but also not verbalized, even experiences that you don't have around you, let's say your father wasn't there or something, all these experiences together, which are, which are thousands and thousands, maybe hundreds or billions of experiences, 
are actually transformed into meaning making for the person. So what happens is that all these ideas that we walk around with, you know, like connection, intimacy, love, uh, uh, success, uh, being a good girl or a good boy, uh, all these ideas are not real in the real world. Do you understand? They are not, we, we can't touch them in the real world. They are all concepts. All these ideas are concepts. They are not existing out there in the real world. But we base our complete reaction in life to the concepts we hold within our brains. So we have, through our experiences, we have all these con concepts in our mind. Oh, this is rejection. This is belonging. This is intimacy. This is love. And so on and so on and so on. So we have templates of that in our meaning making. And our responses are based on how we learned these templates. So to come back to your question, which is really relevant, of course we can. And I, ever since my book, I've actually, I've gotten much more younger people as well uh, with the, the depressed feelings and thoughts, which is interesting. Uh, but as all these things are learned in the past and are taught to us, conscious and un unconscious, mainly unconscious actually, are taught to us through behavior of others around us, significant, significant others around us. Uh, once we understand that, we can actually give different messages to our children. Let me give you an example. In the first, uh, when the first lockdown was here in Amsterdam, I went with my daughter, I've got a, 19, a nine year old, she's, she's nine now, she was eight then. I've got a nine, nine year old, a wonderful daughter. And uh, we went to, uh, we have a, a house on one of the, uh, one of the islands of, of Holland in the north. In, in the nature, and I said, "Oh, let's go, let's let's go to uh, to our chalet in the house, and we bring the dog." So, so I woke up on Saturday morning, and uh, 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 my daughter was building a dollhouse. And any uh, uh, anybody of you know children, you know they can get completely engulfed in building a dollhouse. So she was just building a dollhouse, and she was totally in silence and. And I woke up and the dog looked at me. I interpreted it as, let's go out, you know. So, so I said to my daughter, please get dressed because let's go out for a walk with the dog. We're in nature. And she said, yeah, yeah, dad, in a minute. And as you know, with little children, you know, I, I said it five minutes later and yeah, 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 dad. And 10 minutes later, and, and you know, about 10 times I had taken a shower. In the meantime, I got a text message about a big problem I needed to solve with some contracts and legal stuff, but and it was really challenging to get through that. So this was going on at the same time. At a certain stage, at number 11, I said, now you have to get dressed. So I, I got irritated. And she looked up from her dolls because she was completely engulfed in playing with the dolls. She looked up at me, really startled. And I looked at her and I thought, and I was like, why am I responding to her like this? So I walked back to the bedroom and then I just felt in my body, I felt, why am I so irritated suddenly? And then I realized that my irritation was not related to her, but my irritation was related to the problem I just was attended to. So I immediately walked back to her and I said, sorry, honey, daddy was irritated about something else. It was not about you. And then she looked at me and she smiled and said, oh, let, daddy, let's go out with the dog. So the interesting thing is, what, to, come to, to give you a direct answer in the question, we can actually help our children or children in general by becoming more aware of where our reaction comes from. Because if I take my stress reaction and just pour it all over her without me knowing it, I, I, I play a blame game on her, you understand? And then she, she will get all kinds of meaning about being a bad girl and a, a not a good girl and all that kind of stuff. So I'm very conscious about where does my reaction comes from, come from and I'm very, very aware of, of actually communicating where my reaction comes from so I can actually free her from guilt. Is that an answer for you? Oh, it's quite a good answer, actually. Quite, you know, many of us would have gone through the same problem 
you know, mm-hmm. getting angry at the daughter or the wife because of the stress at the work situation. Exactly. I think I have consumed quite a bit of time. Is it okay if I ask no. other two questions or no? I think we might have to move on, Dr. Philip Raj. Yeah. Um, you know, I hope you don't mind. I yes, saw uh, Oh, Shrikant. I saw something else in the chat box, which is if I if I could elaborate on how. Yeah, that that uh, that that's an option too. Continue yeah. that, Wesley. You can answer that with Dr. Phil Brown. Yeah. So um, the title of "Happiness Is Depressing" actually came. Uh, I've actually written that title through the perspective, oh. through the perspective of depressed eyes. Hello. So I, I've actually. This, so this is a title. Stepping into a depressed person and looking at at life, uh, looking at life and saying, "Well, you know, uh, you know, when, when, let's say when you t- when you take a depressed person and you say, oh, let's go out and do something nice,' the person Hello. might say, "Oh, yeah, that's really nice," yes. but actually on the inside, the person yes, feels yes. Not nice. Can you just nice doesn't exist. exist. No, uh, the meeting is on. Not to worry. Meeting is on. Oh, Derek, your microphone is on. Yeah, yeah. You're just trying back. I'll let me. So I think about the same time having yeah yeah so uh, so I wanted to make clear that from the perspective of the, of a depressed person happiness is actually a depressing thing and I wanted to make clear that uh, the pursuit of happiness actually deepens the, the, the sense of depression because from the depressed perspective uh, happiness is really far away so if all our goals are related around happiness. Actually, the, the, the sadness actually of not having that deepens the, the depressive thoughts and feelings. And that's why I chose for the title, Happiness is Depressing. Uh, um, Dr. Vasily, I, I just wanted, I, I was the one who asked the question. So this leads to more interesting uh, ramifications. Because you said that, uh, Pete, Jordan Peterson is the one who said, yeah. uh, struggle is I more important in life rather than being happy. If you can put on your video. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Derek. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't hear the question. Could you? Uh, yeah. could you... Uh, leading on from what you just said, because pursuit of happiness leads to more depression. Yes. I think uh, Jordan Peterson was the one who actually said it is more important to building of character and struggling is more important than the pursuit of happiness itself. Exactly. Exactly. So that that actually resonates with that. The, yes. The other question I, I had was regarding the model that you gave. It is it, it's very effective and very persuasive, from the body to making meaning and predicting, and then the emotional loop. Two things. One is it sounds very simplistic. I was actually trying to say where I could break this model. I mean, it's a good model. Uh, I was trying to play the devil's advocate and see where I could actually break this model, whether it will apply in all situations. Uh, and the other thing was, yeah. Vasily, we have many questions coming to the other other speakers. Yeah, so keep your response very brief. I'll appreciate that. Of course. Yes. So, the, the, where does the emotion come in? Once you predict the from the meaning yeah. from the prediction, exactly. where does the emotion come in? Good and, question. Yeah. First of all, let me say you look fantastic with your hands. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> uh, uh, so actually, I, I do a lot of teaching right now on how this all works with people and explain it a lot because a lot, there's a lot of depth in there. But emotion is actually the end result of the prediction. So what we feel, when we feel emotion, it doesn't start first. Emotion is the end result of the prediction loop. Oh, so I was, another thing that came up was when the meaning making should be the function of the ego. So in religious systems and in spiritual, spirituality, they talk about man should reduce his ego, which, which will actually make him happier. So mm-hmm. does it uh, resonate with what you're trying to say? If, if somebody's humble, kind and honest, I think uh, most of the complications in life would decrease on its own. So that, that would be a very, very important psychological principle. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Because well, if, if you're humble, you probably will create predictions that are related to that. True. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you us, this comes back to those three important aspects I referred to. Eh? Curiosity, 
empathy and humility ha ah, true true right so true. all this is incompatible all what we are saying comes back to that right and the ego you can't push the ego but it's how we work with the ego we all have egos and so that's it very good so those three incompass if you remember curiosity empathy and humility okay. uh, thank you professor rajul for that we have a question for pratiksha patel uh, from dr from mr budhadev pandey he is asking how do we train the mind to have realistic prediction to avoid stereotyping of what you see okay i think this question probably maybe for uh, professor vasili as well but uh, i i for me as a leader i think is about having the open mind um, and uh, another other area which i haven't quite explicitly mentioned is the cultural differences as well so when we are stereotyping people we are stereotyping based on their race gender culture where, where they come from countries they come from accent they speak so there are a lot of ways of stereotyping people and for one to be open minded it is to overcome that yourself first and then understand and co-create the organization where the stereotyping is not happening uh, and for that uh, we really need the good examples of diverse population at the workplace uh we also often have this inclusion and diversity initiatives coming in the workplace where we talk about what does it mean not to feel included in the workplace as well so when you are stereotyping some somebody else or putting in a we talked about the toxic persons box uh we are stereotyping this person or their personality of their behaviors and then put them in the box so how do we make them feel included as well so the inclusion and diversity is very very important together with the openness of the organization as well and it starts from starting from a appointment and selection process to the reward recognition and promotions and and so on so you really need to have the open mind to avoid the stereotyping thank you for that i think uh, another question for you dr patel is uh, how to deal this is from dr mane she is asking how do you deal with politics at workplace at your personal at a personal level well the answer is i don't <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, and, the, and the reality uh, politics in the workplace is everywhere to be honest whether it is the nhs is a private industry like pharmaceutical research and development i work for it, it is everywhere and uh, i i have a critical court for personal court which i say that i don't do politics but if you don't do i know how to deal with you <laughs> so it is about really not getting too overly involved in the politics which is going in there uh, once the people understand your integrity and where you come from and not necessarily get involved into the campaigns of this or that but really stay focused that is that is the best way to doing the polit- uh, dealing with the politics is really trying to avoid yourself getting involved don't be in the any or uh, anybody's campaign really be there for the person who you are and not taking sides i think this this is the best way i i would go forward um, i really don't like personally the workplace politics and i advise others to stay away from it as much as possible but po- politics is there yes. with human beings it's in your family wherever human beings are and i think what you are referring to is the workplace i suppose personality and uh, this itself is where uh, the whole i think that's where it is very good so i have here um, dr pimsi luis palati joining us from amrita school of institute of medicine uh, in kochi in india in western india um, professor uh, palati is a head head of the department of pharmacology and she is an avid researcher and she has uh, published a number of articles textbooks and also textbook chapters so she is uh, talking to us in relation to her research in the area of um, anxiety in oncology nurses she want to share her insights into this research for 5 minutes so over to you princey unmute princey unmute yourself yeah can i share my screen yes princey that's fine yes yeah uh, princey is a fellow of uh, also of the i alpha institute and has been doing some work 
uh, research work for the institute. Am I, uh, is my screen visible? It is. Yes, yes, yes. Please. And I'm audible. Okay, fine. So friends, I shall be taking you today into the uh, little work that we have done on um, nurses, anxiety in nurses, especially those in oncology. So this was a study initiated by Dr. M. S. Palika. Uh, you had just spoken to him uh, at his institute, in fact. And we have with us, our whole team is here doing this work with, uh, and we have done many other work on bioethics. So this is the abstract, but I will quickly take you through why we thought of doing this study. The study was undertaken because as we are aware, the nursing profession, nursing professionals providing healthcare is, uh, there is occupational stress. And more so, that is evident when it is with cancer, when you're uh, treating and providing healthcare to those with cancer. It, there is an observation that many of the, um, the patients are suffering. So the nurses are seeing the suffering and nurses are also observing the sorrow among, with the patient and the family members. And there is a sort of transference and their general condition would be a state of you know terminological perspective if you would see it would be a maladaptive intense and indeterminate fear that comes and that is anxiety and as young uh, yang et al has said all the purposes of um, anxiety the nurses and those who are in professional and occupational stress lead to anxiety, commonest prevalence of mental Ill health illness is mental illnesses are anxiety. So, and these are misdiagnosed or underreported. So we did this small study in a sm uh, small uh, yet very important place, uh, Institute of Oncology. And here we did this study uh, with the nurses to whom we administered the questionnaire and this questionnaire was the GAD7 developed by Spitzer et al. And this was taken done over a period without disturbing the working hours. So here we use the GAD7 by, developed by Spitzer et al. in 2006. This GAD7 is a good instrument by which you can measure because it includes the criteria, the seven questions, includes the criteria that the DSM uh, for uh, considers for claiming uh, anxiety. So that is the reason why we have taken that. And then I would like to tell you uh, more about the results that we achieved. And in this, as we can see, uh, so in this GAT7, if you see the specificity and the uh, importance of this is about 96% and the specificity is 76%. So it's a good valid tool to measure anxiety. And so this was administered in the nurses. And we saw that uh, according to our simple statistical analysis of T-test and ANOVA, we got a lot of uh, noteworthy findings. And that I would like to share with you. First and foremost, all the nurses who were less than 25, they had a higher incidence. And if you would see, the nurses who had a short duration of experience, uh, less than uh, one year, one to two years and greater than three years, it, it was, uh, you know, the immaturity and the short term of experience gave more, more chance for anxiety development. So in our discussion, we would like to just prove the points of the commonness of experience leads to structured mentoring. That is why the nurses of um, years of experience, they do not face so much. That is structured mentoring and also the fact of um, uh, coping skills are developed by strengthening and uh, 
strengthening it by this. So these were, this was one of the studies. And if you see Selye et al, they have found that physiological assessment of um, anxiety is a good thing, but this is not equivalent to uh, mental illness. But converse is spoken by Lazarus et al. And so friends, what we have to come to realize is that as Dr. Philip Raj also was bringing about, there is a sort of individuality, there is perception, and all this goes on into telling. That's what was elaborated in Lazarus et al. If you were to see um, work anxiety among nurses in their workplace, that book by Jennings is very good. And I would really uh, like that because a lot of insight came there was also another uh, aspect that was told in a TED uh, talk by a nurse. She shared her experiences and she said that nurses spend a contact time of patients with patients about eight to 12 hours. And they are actually seeing and feeling what the patients experience. And there is some amount of transference in this. And that would lead to uh, anxiety. Anxiety is also, uh, um, is anxiety inherently is not deleterious as I was surprised to find out, but uh, the concepts coming from it uh, can, can be deleterious uh, as a consequence uh, of the response of the anxiety can be deleterious as you can see uh, that it can give, give rise to so many uh, aspects of mental disorders, mental health, depression, all these go on consequently. So friends, this was one of our little studies, but we are working also on another. I would like to um, uh, remember and acknowledge Dr. Oliver Seaman. We are doing a study with the repetitive transcranial magnetic uh, uh, simulator. This is a very good instrument that with which we are doing. Our study has taken only 50% of the participants when we got into the COVID. So till now we have not taken the rest of the half. So uh, Dr. Russell and Dr. Oliver and with Dr. Shrikant, we are doing this as a multicentric study. So it will be completed in the field. That is going to help in workplace stress. And as Dr. Balika had said, we had done a power nap uh, study, which he had done. And now in this, we have used power nap as a standard control and we are using RTMS. So stress, a workplace R stress R is important. So thank you for giving me this opportunity, Dr. Russell and Dr. Shrikant. So this was a little study which I wanted to share with you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I think I would like to say that um, we had a wonderful first session with speakers giving fantastic talks and excellent um, insights into various areas of um, stress, anxiety, post-COVID situation. I think I'm just mindful of time. Uh, the speakers will stay for the rest of the session this afternoon. So I want to say that we have a wonderful second session with the speakers joining us from France, um, Pierre Mazou, who is the head of corporate social responsibility. Uh, Avinash Disouza joining us from India, Derek Disouza from Pune, and we also have um, Debbie Hare, Chartered Forensic Psychologist, and Grace Day, trainee forensic psychologist from Chesfold Park Hospital, who have done some fantastic research in some of the areas related to psychological flexibility, burnout, and personality types. So you'll have a wonderful session. So please join us this afternoon, and um, I think uh, I'll share more insights. Uh, into some of the work we have do we have been doing at Chesfield Park Hospital in the academic center, um, and also uh, the collaboration we have with many centers around the world. Lastly, I am mindful. I got a message from Dr. Sheshagiri, um, who is uh, who may not be able to join us uh, for the rest of the session. He has few words to say. Um, so over to you, uh, Dr. Sheshagiri. Yeah, thank you very much Please for stop. giving me this Can opportunity. The, the sharing, Princey. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Th thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. What an excellent uh, academic session! I really learned a lot today. It's very, very, uh, you know, interactive, very insightful. Uh, I just want to congratulate the organizers uh, and uh, particularly, you know, Professor Disauza and Professor Srikanth. 
uh, for this uh, or for organizing this. Uh, and I, I, I've seen I, IAOPM uh, for a, uh, since it is kind of instituted and I can see it going from strength to strength and really becoming a, a real global organization. And I wish them all the best and I wish them to continue the good work they're doing. Best wishes to all. Thank you for your good wishes. So Thank you. I think I'm just mindful of time. So I'll end this session and we'll join again in half an hour for the second session. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Shishu, uh, uh, Yuri. Thank you very much. <laughs>